Hey, how's everyone doing? Good, and yourself? Good. Busy and scattered as usual. That's usually a good thing, though. It is. It is. As long as you have a few minutes somewhere in there to, you know, find a grounding. And I have yet to get that today, but it'll come. <laughs> How are you, Maxi? I'm fine. I'm taking a mate. Uh, I came an hour ago from work, prepared a sandwich, uh, and tried. Uh, I, I want to to have a good time here, so here I am. Excellent. Sandwich is good. I've got my coffee. David, do you have anything with you? I've got a, a Gatorade Fruit Punch G2. That's See, what I'm now, rocking right now. Very sophisticated. Huh? The G2? athlete. <laughs> Are you crazy <laughs> having a G2 before Global Star Party? <laughs> You're not going to drive, right? No, no. <laughs> okay. All right. You oh, watch all of his... He's going to tug to the <laughs> blue day, so it was a, a good one. This thing is... No, never mind. It's zero proof. Damn it. <laughs> I chose the wrong thing. <laughs> See, I'm thinking David is going to save people the uh, the the need to increase the speed rating to 1.5. He's just going to go with that. <laughs> 1.5, two times. Let's go as fast as we can. You know, G2 is the designation of the uh, observed gas cloud that you remember a few years ago that was supposed to potentially fall into the central black hole in the Milky Way and create a little outburst of energy that never happened. So G2 disappointed us. Oh. Never happened yet. There's still a few thousand years yet. to keep an eye. That, that's true. That's like the people who say, well, you know, Beetlejuice didn't supernova. Well, well, it will, you know, if you start your countdown clock between now and 500,000 years from now, it probably will, you know, but people are a little anxious with these things sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I think too. Uh, maybe uh, why um, a couple of years ago, Astronomers uh, point their telescope to M to the the black hole of M eighty seven, and mm -hmm. not from 
uh, Sagittarius A. Uh, I, I did find why they don't point the, the most uh, near black hole from us. That's a good question. And the short answer is because the black hole in M87 has a thousand times the mass of the Milky Way's central supermassive black hole. Oh. So even though it's, you know, at Virgo cluster distance, it was a, an easier image to take. Although, mind you, that was the shadow of the black hole, the, not the black hole that was imaged, like the, the, all the press, you know, said at the time. Okay, I that's clear me out. Thank you. But that was that's one of the most massive, supermassive black holes known, the one in M87. And maybe we can point another, for example, in Sculptor Galaxy or uh, Andromeda, maybe. And they are working on the Milky Way as well, but which is heavily obscured, of course, and it's only a 4 million solar mass black hole. It's not a terribly large one for, you know, the centers of galaxies, of course. Most all galaxies have central supermassive black holes in them, except for dwarf galaxies, of course. Okay, or, or satellite galaxy, for example, the Large Magellanic Cloud, right? Uh, yeah, but it's a really small one because that's such a small galaxy overall. Okay. Thank you. Now, there are exceptions, though. You know, M33, the third biggest galaxy in the local group, has no central supermassive black hole, and it's not exactly clear why, because really? it's a pretty good-sized normal spiral. Mm -hmm. How did they know that? David? Well, just from looking at the velocities of stars and gas near the center, which is how they're all inferred. I see. Because you can only explain that velocity, the moment, the 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 um, velocities of gas within that smaller region and stars by um, and by a central black hole, and then you can calculate and infer the mass of the black hole from the velocities. Now, one thing I haven't seen, I haven't seen whether there's a correlation between the dwarf <coughs> galaxies that don't have supermassive black holes and the ones that don't seem to have perceptible amounts of dark matter. Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I think we're in early days with questions like, like that. And, and uh, you know, there is a correlation generally with the, si with the mass of a galaxy and the growth of its central black hole as well, but it doesn't always hold either. And that's not exactly clear why. Yeah, and you know, generally, generally speaking, the more massive the galaxy, the more massive the black hole. Of course. Yeah. And also, you have the gravitational, gravitational lens producing by the, the the supermassive black hole, right? There are a lot of gravitational lenses around. Um, yep. And and. Uh, you know, the Einstein cross is probably the most interesting in some ways, but there, there are lots of them that are lensing quasars and other, and other distant galaxies. You know, you can see gravitational lensing in the really rich clusters of galaxies. Yeah. The Hercules cluster, the Coma cluster, et cetera. You know, there's so many galaxies and distant objects uh, beyond that those are rich areas for gravitational lensing, of course. I saw in a documentary that explained in this a gravitational lens. I don't remember the galaxy particularly, but I think with the halo, they can. Um, it's like they will travel across the time because they saw a supernova uh, that happened, but uh, that same galaxy was th th in a different way. In, in another point, but in another point, it was a different way, I think. And it's like they can uh, predict that supernova that it, it uh, uh, happened in the past, but uh, you can see like it was, it was the same galaxy, mm -hmm. but in four different times. It's, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that was correct or why understood I understand good that but uh, it was really shocking hmm. yeah I'm, I'm not sure um, about that 
Let me find me if I can. Let me search yeah. it. Hello, David. How are you? Hello, David. <laughs> Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific, and um, let me turn off this little bit of an echo. David Iker and I were playing uh, Star Star Trek or Star Wars or something. Can you please leave that on, Scott? Just leave it on. <laughs> it's so annoying. <laughs> Maybe if I breathe heavy and make growling noises and stuff, I don't know. You sound just like the all-powerful <laughs> beings from episode 13 of season, no, never mind, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, we were we were having fun. So, um, but um, yeah, all, the audience always lets me know if I have an echo or any kind of audio problem. So, so and I do appreciate it. Um, uh, this is the eighty eighth Global Star Party. I can you know when I was when I was writing out all this stuff and everything, I was going, geez, eighty eight of them. You know, uh, that's that's quite a few and. Uh, uh, the thing that's kind of cool is, as I, you know, I've been to a lot of other just like in-person star parties, some some annual star parties that I would go to, like the, for instance, the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference or the Winter Star Party, and you would kind of, uh, you know, you would have this kind of, you know, really great feeling while you're there because you're there with your peers, you you saw friends that that uh, maybe you only saw once a year or something like that, and. Uh, and then that would kind of have to, you know, satisfy me for a number of months, okay, until I could go to another one. But yet here we are, we're doing this every week. I get to see some of the best friends that I have, okay, every week, and uh, and we meet new ones, um, and and we have uh, we run into really, I mean, really interesting people. Uh, you know, uh, in the Global Star Party, um, and you know, you're going to meet some of them tonight uh, that maybe you're not familiar with, but um, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm excited every time we do it. I look forward to it every, you know, even during the weekend, I'm thinking about Tuesdays coming up, you know, and, and what's, you know, how's, how's the Global Star Party gonna play out, you know? So um, I'm really grateful that we can do it. Um, you know, I'm grateful for the technology. I'm grateful to the audience. I'm you know, very grateful to the presenters. Uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, we'll get started here uh, with number 88 and the, the theme was reflections. And so sometimes I think about, you know, what should the theme be, you know, and uh, I try to think on past uh, uh, global star parties that we've done. Uh, I think about what's in the news, uh, you know, with uh, in the astronomy field. Uh, and I think I try to think about how has 
uh, you know, the star parties uh, affected the audience? How does it affect the presenters and that kind of thing? And um, uh, so uh, one of the presenters that's coming on tonight, John Briggs, uh, he is the new, newly appointed secretary of the Alliance of Historic Observatories. And he was telling me about this publication that he's going to be writing for called Reflections. And I thought, wow, okay, that, that's a great name for this Global Star Party. So that's where it comes from. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, through Reflections, of course, you know, we see starlight reflecting off of mirrors and uh, captured onto our instruments or into our eyes. We reflect back on our experiences uh, in astronomy. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we reflect on what it all means, you know, so there's so many meanings to this uh, that I thought it was, it was good and uh, some, somewhat generic enough that, uh, you know, the presenters can take it any way that they'd like to. So, um, so anyways, uh, for now, I'd like to reflect on my, you know, friendship with uh, David Levy, who uh, starts out our Global Star Parties. He is a wonderful guy, very inspiring, uh, someone that uh, is always, uh, always participating in astronomy in one, one fashion or another. Uh, he's given hundreds of, uh, you know, maybe thousands of lectures. I think it is now thousands. Uh, he's written uh, articles uh, his entire life. He's got a whole slew of books and, uh, uh, but you know, he's out observing uh, every clear night that he can, uh, trying to search for more comets, uh, supernova, supernovae, you know, maybe a minor planet or two of which, you know, I know he's, he's discovered many. So, um, but he's a great inspiration to, uh, to you and to me and, uh, he always, um, uh, through his, his inspirational words, uh, set the tone for a global star party. And so I'm going to turn it over to you, David. Thanks for coming on again for the 88th. Thank you so much, Scott. I am uh, really honored to be here. We're talking about reflections. And I would like to suggest a direct link right now with reflections and a literal link because out in the observatory, which is maybe about 100 meters away from me, is a 12 inch F5 reflector, which is right now, I think the, the second highest quality telescope I've got. It is wonderful. And uh, I use it almost every night and I just love it. And it is also an honor to say that it is an Explore Scientific Telescope. Thank I'd also you, like to mention that this summer we're going to try to have an in-person star uh, retreat, the Adirondack Astronomy Retreat, and I'm hoping I can encourage some of you to come to it this summer. I will be there for the first part, the Sunday, the last, the Sunday, I think it's the 26th or 27th of July, and uh, going on for until the Wednesday when I have to be back in order to go to the Astronomical League meeting with Wendy. But I'm hoping that some of you will decide and want to come to come to that this summer. For my quotation today for reflections, I'm going to quote Carolyn's favorite poem, which is from Shakespeare, is from Romeo and Juliet. Come, gentle night. Come, loving black browed night give me my romeo and when he shall die take him and cut him out in little stars and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun thank you scott and back to you thank you very much david hey david where can people find uh, more information about your uh, star party how would they contact you um actually i was going to suggest that they contact you okay um, <laughs> i'll help you <laughs> sure yeah sure wendy wendy has a, an answer to that uh, why don't i give you patrice's email okay we could give you patrice's email okay 
Okay, well, am I allowed to give it over to this? Um, oh. See, I would suggest that they get in touch with you, Scott, and then okay. you for it. I'll send it. I'll send the email over to you. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll do it this way. We'll let people who are interested in this email Explore Alliance yeah. at explorescientific.com. He also has a Facebook page, and that's easy to get to. You just look him up on Facebook and say, I want information about the retreat, and then he will send it to you. Yes. Patrice Ketelin is his name. How do you spell it? S-C-A-T-T-O-L-I-N. S-C-A-T-T-O-L-I-N. Scatalon. Scatalin. Okay. Scatalin. Patrice. P A T R I C E. Yeah. P A T R I C E. He's a wonderful friend of mine. Okay. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to encourage some of you to come this summer. And I'll okay. be there for the first half of it. Well, wonderful. Okay. Well, I, you know, I know that it would be, you know, anytime that you can go out observing with uh, David Levy and his friends is going to be a memorable night. So, um, you know, and you'll get that chance also at the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party coming up in September as well. But yeah, the retreat is different. Well. Yeah, the retreat is different and it's very uh, special, you know, so, um, so I, I highly recommended, highly recommended. Okay. We also have the debate of the philosophers, which is really pretty much fun. It's Peter Chedeke and um, Marty Rice. They are the two philosophers of our event, and they sit and talk, and then whoever wins gets thrown into the pond by the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, so th that's a lot of fun. And okay. uh, I think you, I think you ever, most of the people who come really have a good time. And, uh, I, I know they will. I know they will. Somebody. Right. Okay. All right. Well, let's um, thank you, David. Um, yes. uh, again, if you guys have any questions about uh, the uh, Adirondack retreat with David Levy, you know, feel free to get in touch with me directly if you'd like, and uh, we'll we'll get you all connected. So um, let's. Uh, Let's move on to, uh, you know, we, we do door prizes on every Global Star Party. And so, uh, and those are hosted by the Astronomical League, uh, sponsored by the Astronomical League. And uh, the Astronomical League is the world's largest federation of astronomy clubs with over 300 clubs under its umbrella. Uh, uh, I think over 20,000 members. Uh, belong to it and it's growing and um, they have amazing uh, observing uh, programs, awards programs. Uh, they really know how to nurture and guide uh, you know the astronomical community of which they're they're you know uh, leading. So um, so Don Nab will be on with us today. He's going to be talking about uh, the past uh, winners and uh, read off the new questions for the door prizes. So you're going to want to listen up to this. Hey, Don. Hey, Scott. How you doing? Good. All right. Thanks Let me, for coming uh, on. Share my screen with you. We'll go over uh, go over these things. Start the slideshow. Coming through okay? Yes. <clears throat> All right. We first. We start off every every presentation like this with a warning about viewing the sun. <clears throat> unless you want to cook your eyeballs, you never want to look at the sun unless it's a properly filtered telescope or binoculars. Uh, you can't use uh, welder's glasses. You can't use any little uh, eclipse glasses over a telescope. You can wear eclipse glasses on your face, but not use them on a telescope or binoculars. Has to be done the right way or you can end up blind for the rest of your life and that would not be fun. You wouldn't see any more things in the night sky or the daytime sky. So uh, we always, always consult with someone knowledgeable before you attempt to observe the sun. Okay, last week, March 22nd, presented by Terry, March 28th, that was 
yesterday morning, there was a conjunction. What two planets will the moon glide by? And that was Venus and Saturn in the morning sky. I did not get up to see it. I was had to get up early to walk dogs at a rescue that morning, so I could not see it. What meteor shower peaks April 23rd? The lurid meteor shower, looking forward to that. And then May 15th, 16th, that night, a total lunar eclipse. What name has the media given this? They always call it a blood moon because the light of all the sunsets and sunrises around the earth is refracted into the moon and gives it a red glow. So here are the winners that will be added to the name of your prize list for, for pulling. Cameron Gillis, Josh Kovach, Andrew Corkill. I got them right. And Matthew McAwilly. Okay, questions for tonight. And I came up with these. So uh, here's the first one. When astronauts come back from space, they are young, slightly younger than if they never left. Is that true or is that false? Here's uh, Scott Kelly. This picture was taken during his year in space. So when they come back from space, are they younger than if they never left, true or false? And as always, send answers to secretary at astroleague.org. And I know Terry would like to have them by the end of the week. Next, Pizza. Pizza Hut delivered a pizza to the ISS in 2001. What topping was featured on this pizza? Was it anchovies, mushroom, salami, or sausage? Hmm. And uh, I have I've, I've found out that that pizza cost Pizza Hut about a million dollars to get <laughs> transported to the ISS. Uh, they paid the uh, Russian space agency to do it, and they uh, they actually got some advertisement out of it. But it could not be U.S. astronauts. They weren't allowed to be compensated. So uh, it was only Russian astronauts. So in 2001, what was the feature topping? And lastly, if you weigh 200 pounds on Earth, how much do we weigh on Mars? 45 pounds, 76 pounds, 121 pounds, or how dare you ask to lead that question? All right. <laughs> 200 pounds on Earth, what would your weight be on Mars? Again, send answers to secretary at astroleague.org and Terry Mann will sort through them. And last thing announced that two weeks from this coming Friday, we have our next Astronomical League Live with uh, John Wescovich talking about the Lagrange points, which is where the James Webb uh, Space Telescope is currently parked. And on that show will be Carol Org, Terry Mann, Scott, and David Levy. And don't forget the uh, Alcon is coming up July 20th to 30th in uh, Albuquerque. Yep. Okay, back to and you, I Scott. look forward to that. We'll be there as well So great. at the Alcon event. So that's going to be great. Awesome. Well, Don, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Great, thanks. Okay, thank you. All right. So... Um, up next uh, is uh, David Eicher. If you were listening in <clears throat> earlier before we uh, uh, we started running the um, the videos, you would have heard David uh, talking with uh, Maxi Falaris and and you know they were talking about a number of things. The thing is, so I I like this part, the early part of the show because we get off on a lot of different topics uh, and we get to really pick David Eicher's brain and. Uh, you know, this guy knows so much about the cosmos, galaxies, most things. I mean, I have yet to actually hear David Eicher getting stumped on something. Um, but uh, uh, so it's it's always a, a pleasure and, uh, you know, uh, an honor to have David Eicher, the editor in chief of Astronomy Magazine, the world's largest uh, publication on the subject. And um, so uh, he is, uh, I think that every time that we do a global star party and he's there, I just, you know, I feel the friendship growing more and more. Of course, David and I have met each other in, in real life. And, uh, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing him uh, again soon at a star party. And the next one we'll be going to will be Starmus, which I think David will talk a little bit about. So um, David, it's a pleasure to have you on our 88th global star party. Thank you, Scott. And today I'm going to talk uh, 
about things that are a little bit closer to home than supermassive black holes we were talking about earlier. Um, but uh, get into some more planetary geology, if you will, with some minerals, because as we know, when we look, I'm going to start the slideshow and I hope you'll be able to see that. As we've talked about before, uh, as we look out into the universe very distantly, even we know through spectroscopy that chemistry is the same. And, and so we can hold uh, examples of planetary geology in our hands, minerals that are created um, on Earth here, and imagine that there are many, many, many similar uh, minerals out there on worlds um, in our galaxy and in many, many galaxies beyond. So it gives us a way of looking at Earth. Earth, Earth is a planet too, remember? But uh, we can also imagine the many, many other worlds that are out there, no doubt, in the universe. So the universe is a universe of order. Uh, one of the great early Americans, Thomas Jefferson, uh, said, I believe in a divinely ordered universe. Long before his time, Isaac Newton, one of the founders of modern science, um, was quoted saying, truth is ever to be found in the simplicity and not in the multiplicity and confusion of things. And the underlying point here is that the universe is ordered not by supernatural design, uh, but by the principles of physics. As Richard Dawkins, one of our Starmus pals, likes to say, you don't need to magic things into existence. Uh, but science explains why things are the way they are. Minerals demonstrate that because their atoms are assembled in precise ways by electrochemical attractions that bring uh, the atoms together. Uh, the in these are inherent properties of the atoms and they guide and assemble them when the conditions are right and the right atoms are there into uh, what min mineralogists call a specific crystal lattice. So, working our way through the world. We're not going to look at all 5,000 mineral species, don't worry. This will not go on to Global Star Party 512. Okay, so don't panic. We're, we're working our way through here pretty well. Uh -huh. At some point, I'll turn back to astronomy here, uh, pure astronomy. But uh, for the moment tonight, we'll look at some zinc minerals. We haven't looked at the zinc yet as an important uh, metallic element. Uh, and the most common of all the zinc minerals, of which there are many, of course, you can imagine, is sphalerite, which is zinc sulfide. Uh, it was called originally blend by Agricola, the early mineralogist in 1546. It was also named zincum in the Middle Ages, even before then. It was named sphalerite, the, the current modern name by the German mineralogist Ernst Friedrich Glocker. Uh, in the 1840s uh, from the Greek word sphaleros for treacherous, referring to various varieties of this mineral being confused with galena, which is zinc sulf, which is another uh, uh, similar zinc mineral. Colors of this mineral are uh, light to dark brown, black, red, brown, colorless, light blue, uh, and, and some others. It's a major ore of zinc. It's found in a variety of deposits sedimentary rocks of various kinds, lead and zinc deposit in carbonates, and uh, uh, often in volcanic sulfides. And so we'll look at a few random zinc minerals tonight as we've been looking at examples of things. Sphalerite itself, its crystallography uh, is isometric, which is a fancy word as we've talked about for cubic. <clears throat> and you can see the distribution of zinc and sulfur atoms in a sphalerite crystal here with a crystallographic diagram. Pretty simple stuff. Here's a good modern example of sphalerite, which is this sort of dark uh, reddish brown crystals that are, that are on matrix here from a Chinese locality uh, and quartz kind of coating the, what mineralogists call a country rock, which is the ordinary rock that hosts the mineral crystals. And we'll just look at some different kinds of minerals that are that are largely made up, uh, predominantly importantly made up of zinc, among other things. Austenite is another one, calcium zinc arsenate hydroxide. Uh, this is a, a uh, specimen. It's just sort of flowery white stuff, as you can see. Specimen from the famous district in Utah of Tueli County, which has lots and lots of interesting minerals there. 
This is a, uh, a, an astronomy site that almost got going years ago here at, at a place called Granite Gap down in, uh, in southwestern New Mexico. They're not far from the Arizona Sky Village. This specimen comes from a willamite, which is a common zinc mineral, a zinc silicate, um, and some other associated minerals with it um, from Granite Gap uh, down in Hidalgo County, New Mexico. Rosasite is copper zinc carbonate hydroxide. This is from a very famous mine, the Huela mine in Mapami, uh, Durango, Mexico. Mexico. Um, there are many, many uh, minerals, uh, zinc, other carbonates that come from this specific mine. You'll see some others in a moment here. Very well known mine. Hemimorphite is zinc silicate hydroxide hydrate, and this is a Chinese example, a relatively recent find of the last decade or so uh, from the Wenshan mine there that has some a little bit of copper in it to color it a fairly strong blue. This is hemimorphite with a very different, you can see the crystals are very, very different in the colors as well of the same mineral often. This is from that famous uh, Durango mine again, uh, but a very, very different kind of look of hemimorphite. Skolzite is calcium zinc phosphate hydrate. Uh, this is a small example uh, with these needle-like crystals from Australia. And lagrandite is a rare mineral. It's a sort of a bright lemon yellow in color. It's a zinc arsenate hydroxide hydrate. And this is again from that very famous mine. This is a pretty rare mineral though that is prized by collectors. Willamite, zinc silicate again, uh, from a very famous old time mine in Namibia that was mined uh, going way, way back into the early and mid 19th century by German engineers who went down to Namibia at, in the region of Sumeb. It's a very famous old time mine there. More Willamite, again, from the same mine mm. with a different look. You can see the, you know, very kind of different uh, crystallographic looks here from the yeah. same site. Atomite is zinc arsenate hydroxide, and this is a fairly strongly colored kind of atomite here, the Greek specimen uh, with some copper atoms in there that give it that sea green uh, or, or blue green color. This is the same mineral atomite, but here contaminated, if you will, by a few atoms uh, in the mix of manganese, which uh, color it this sort of lilac or purple colored crystals, again from that same uh, Durango, Mexico famous mine. Alumino atomite is, is colored here by aluminum atoms. And you can see these tiny little uh, rosettes uh, that have a very sort of bright uh, blue-green color here. This is another Greek specimen here. <clears throat> Kotagite is a rare uh, zinc mineral. It's an arsenate hydrate. And it has these kind of fan-like aggregates that radially spread out here. It's an unusual mineral, again, from the same mine in Durango, Mexico. Big, big uh, uh, locality for zinc minerals. This is from the Congo, this piece, which has a variety wow. of, of minerals in it, zinc, and again, some copper that snuck in, I, I suspect, to color it, give it its bluish color. Beautiful. Uh, this is from a mine that is uh, north of Tucson, not far from David country here. Willamite with some uh, little orangey yellow uh, wolfenite crystals as well. It's a lead molybdate mineral we've talked about before. But this is a famous Arizona mine, the Mammoth St. Anthony mine, which is a, a little ways up at Tiger, Arizona, north of, of Tucson. Aracalcite is zinc copper uh, carbonate hydroxide. This is white calcite in this uh, matrix from that same Mexican mine. Lots of mileage out of that tonight. Um, and you can see the aracalcite is, is the very light blue green colored stuff that's in the whitish calcite here. And another one, hemimorphite uh, with some cal white calcite uh, associated as well. Uh, from another mine that's a little farther up north of Tucson, uh, but not all the way up to Phoenix, uh, called the 79 Mine, a very famous 
mine that I bet you can guess what year in the 19th century this mine was established. Um, and uh, it, it's a good producer of all sorts of uh, fine specimens as well. This is a nice one uh, from north of Tucson as well. And just to quickly mention again, as Scott uh, spoke about briefly, uh, we're going to have Starmus this year again for the sixth time, the International Science Festival uh, that will have many, many astronaut and Nobel Prize winning speakers and even some common folk like me speaking there. Uh, but we will have Charlie Duke and Nicole Stodd and Kip Thorne and George Smoot and Garrick Israeli and the festival's founder, Jill Tarter, and many, many others to be announced in the coming weeks. We also, uh, because star, Starmus means stars and music, we'll have some rock and roll and uh, past performers and we'll announce uh, who's going to be involved. It'll be a very exciting lineup this year again. Past performers have included Brian May, Rick Wakeman, Peter Gabriel, Brian Eno, Hans Zimmer, Steve Vai, Grace Potter, and Sarah Brightman. And many of them I can tell you will most likely be back this year. We'll be celebrating this year the 50th anniversary, really, let's call it 51 years of uh, exploration on Mars with the uh, Soviet Mars 3 and the American Mariner 9 missions that opened up our entire uh, era that came of understanding the red planet, uh, one of our favorite planets, um, as another fellow who I think is following tonight, a pal of mine, Kevin Schindler, uh, can uh, elucidate coming from Lowell Observatory there. So that's what I have tonight uh, in the world of zinc. Uh, and I will stop sharing my screen and give it back to you, Scott. And thanks once again for putting up with me with another round of planetary geology. Yeah, I love it. I love it. You know, of course, uh, uh, the universe doesn't stop or start at the sky, you know, so um, it's, uh, it's everything and everywhere, you know, so. Good work, David. Yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, David, uh, also, uh, you know, I, I, I like to promote the magazine, Astronomy Magazine, on the show. And, uh, uh, you know, what are, the, uh, what are the editors working on currently at Astronomy? Well, thank, thank you, Scott, for, for asking. We have a big, big era coming because, you know, the, you know, Lord help us, but the, the pandemic really infused the astronomy hobby with a lot of new energy and new people into it. So there's a tremendous amount of stuff going on right now. Next year will be the magazine's 50th anniversary. So we have a whole lot of special things planned for next year. Uh, one of which is a complete and total secret, but I can tell you that Mr. David Levy is going to be involved with a project that will kick off this anniversary year for us. And uh, sooner, however, we have uh, some things coming up, like a special issue that's just about to go to press that is uh, a, a issue devoted to space art and the state of the art of space art. It'll have 50 of the best space art pieces uh, oh, wow. in it presented in one issue. It's never been done in a magazine like this before in collaboration with the IAAA, the a space art group that's based there, essentially based in Tucson, and the president lives in Southern California. Uh, and we have the greatest space art of the members of the IAAA uh, to present in this issue that's coming up a couple months from now. So we're very excited about that. We've got some special surprises that are coming uh, later uh, this fall as well that are a little ways out that I'll mention in another couple of months. And then next year is going to be really big because we have a lot of special things coming with our big 50th anniversary year. I can only imagine that's going to be great. So, yeah, I put a link into the chat. Uh, if you don't have a subscription to Astronomy Magazine, get one uh, and go to astronomy.com and you can sign up for the digital or the printed or both, you know, so um it, it's great to uh to have i also wanted to mention too before we we go on to uh, uh mr john briggs who who's up next uh but uh both david and the, both davids here have uh books uh that we like to uh promote uh, david levy's biographical book um uh is uh is available through starzona.com uh 
you know, and I think if you're, if you, if you'd like to have it and David's very accommodating, usually he'll sign it for you. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's great. And it, it is, uh, it's an amazing book, uh, you know, to the, where David Levy really reveals, uh, you know, uh, the vulnerable side of him, but also the triumphs that he's had in his life. And it's really a, an incredible book to read. Uh, David Eicher has uh, several books um, uh, that are out. And um, uh, so one of them is uh, Galaxies. You had a 3D uh, book of, of uh, deep sky objects. Can you list some of those for us, David? The most recent 3D book uh, was Cosmic Clouds, uh, Where ah. Stars Are Born, which I did with my pal Brian May, who's very right. much into stereoscopy and, and involved with Starmus as well, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the recent one. Galaxies from Random House was sort of the uh, update a couple of years ago on the Tim Ferriss Galaxies book of a generation ago. Our sort of understanding of galaxies has really exploded over the last, you know, 20 years. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then there's a book that I've done with my pal, uh, Mike, Michael Bakich, uh, that's a kid's book that's coming out this fall um, uh, that is a child's introduction to space exploration that will be coming out from Black Dog and Leventhal Publishers in September as well. So we're excited about that to get a new generation of kids pumped about this whole era of space that's coming. Excellent, that's great. Well, thank you guys. Um, uh, so up next is uh, uh, Mr. John Briggs. John is the newly appointed secretary of the Alliance of Historic Observatories. And this is an organization that is made up of uh, Palmar Observatory, Lowell Observatory, which uh, uh, Kevin Schindler will be talking about next. Um, and, uh, you know, the Griffith Park, uh, the Vatican, uh, Lick Observatory, um, and I think I'm missing one or two others at this Yerkes, moment. But Yerkes, it's Yerkes. Hard, it's hard yeah, I, I, I missed it earlier yeah. today, too. I don't know yeah. how I can miss it. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's a it is uh, it's still in its formative stages. There is a website that I'll share in chat here in, in a few minutes. Um, but uh, you know, they this this uh, organization is coming together to make historic observatory stronger and uh, to give a, a greater voice to uh, the uh, communities that they serve and also to uh, you know share the, more of the inspiration that uh, they, they churn out. So um, so anyhow, uh, I'll turn it over to John, but uh, I'll say a little bit about John. His, his, his biography of, of accomplishments is, extreme, is extensive. <laughs> He's worked at many, many observatories, uh, uh, and I think that he is the perfect one to uh, be involved as at the uh, you know the so-called management level of the Alliance of Historic Observatories. He's been a president of uh, the uh, Antique Telescope Society, um, and uh, you know if you go to any of the observatories or you attend any of the major star parties, and you just mention the name John Briggs, lots of people are going to recognize that name. So. Um, hopefully, hopefully not throwing stones. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And we've also had the pleasure of having John on Global Star Party several times. So I'm very, very happy to have you back. And I'll let you uh, take it from here. And I'll let you uh, also do the uh, proper introductions for Ke Kevin Schindler. Excellent, Scott. Well, I'm glad to have you with me right now because we shared the experience together what was it? Uh, a, a, a little over two years ago. That's right. The, just the before first, COVID. Yeah, yeah. It was just before COVID, but I was very excited. Um, living here in semi-retirement in New Mexico, to get um, an invitation uh, from Sam Hale, and also uh, from you, because as 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 I understand, it was really you and Sam Hale working together. Mm -hmm. um, Sam Hale being the grandson of George Ellery Hale, and Sam is the, the chairman of the board of Mount Wilson Institute now. Um, but various people, in, uh, including you two, recognized uh, the importance of some of these uh, noble facilities communicating a little bit more with each other. 
Yes. And um, maybe doing uh, uh, the idea of, of, of some brainstorming between uh, these facilities uh, made sense. And uh, so this meeting was called at Mount Wilson. And I was president of Antique Telescope Society at the time. And I had, uh, you know, in one way or another, uh, volunteered things for Mount Wilson, because it's one of the places that I lived and worked for a while. I was just very lucky to do so. And um, so I got to be there too. And we found ourselves, didn't we, Scott, um, among other places, uh, but, but at, the, at the beautiful library room in the so-called monastery, yes. the astronomer's dormitory, Yes. Uh, down yes. sort of at the end at the end of a of, of a of a of a spectacular little road up there up on the, the ridge top and it was a very intimate setting and I, I've got to admit um, because the group was so small and because so many of the people present were like observatory directors and you know right. I, I'm just I'm just a grown-up amateur astronomer. And I've worked as a technician, as an engineer, in various capacities, any way I could, following projects that had funding here and there. So now you, you know, people look at my 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 history and and and, and so, geez, worked at a lot of places. Well, I kind of kind of have to in my in my situation. But anyway, so uh, it was I, kind of mind blowing for me to be in the company of such senior astronomers. Yes. Um, and we had a wonderful Me time. And, and it was pretty clear that uh, many of these institutions, like particularly Yerkes Observatory, um, you know, we can't take these places for granted so much anymore. A lot of institutions that we've grown up with, admiring them, reading about them, visiting them, sometimes having a chance to get involved with them one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, even you think about something like Sky and Telescope Magazine as an institution, and Sky and Telescope now owned by the American Astronomical Society, fortunately. Um, the continuance of institutions like Yerkes and even Mount Wilson, which decades ago lost its funding from the Carnegie Institution, you mm -hmm. can't take the... Um, uh, the per, what's the word perpetuity? <laughs> but that's uh, oh sure. Uh, some of these things for granted, and so uh, a sen some senior astronomers are historically minded. Uh, for example, the late Don Osterbrock, um, the former director of Lick Observatory, he wrote so many fabulous history of astronomy books in his retire. Well, in, you know, towards the end of his career. Um, a lot of astronomers are very concerned with history. So these observatory directors, uh, uh, the ones, the, the, the institutions you mentioned, thought it was worthwhile to, to accept the invitation from Sam Hale. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for, for those folks listening who have not had a chance to visit this fireplace library room in kind of a, an obscure spot at Mount Wilson, it's 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 really it's kind of a sacred spot. Uh, um, uh, Albert Einstein visited there once, and there are photographs of him uh, sitting around in chairs. And this thing is the same furniture; it's still there. Same so furniture. It's exciting. That's yeah, right. It's, it's, That's it's, right. It's, it's, People it's, were sitting yeah. in the same exact chair that Einstein yeah, was sitting I, in. I think a number. You know, it's not like, <laughs> like it was yeah. a copy or something. It was That's the exact right. Chair. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, somebody had the photograph, I think, and a number of us took turns sitting yes. in the chair and, and people were snapping pictures. It was just a lot of fun. But it's, you're, you're really, you were living a uh, very exciting history, going back to a place like Mount Wilson or to any of these places, and the chance to be in the, uh, in the same very spots where so many heroes of, of yesteryear astronomy were. But the thing is, these similar kind of arguments can also be made for smaller observatories. I, I grew up in Massachusetts, on the near, very near the border of Rhode Island. So um, one of the most important astronomy clubs in my youth was 
Skyscrapers Incorporated, the Astronomy Club of Rhode Island, okay. that runs Seagrave Memorial Observatory, which houses an eight inch Alvin Clark from the 1870s. And it was a very cool place. And um, I was so happy when in the company of these very senior astronomers, thinking about the future of these very big institutions typically and how they could perhaps redefine themselves in some ways to perpetuate themselves as education and inspiration sites and how they can coordinate that. These same thoughts also apply to a lot of other places, including small observatories um, that have a similar potential for inspiring us all when we have a chance to experience them. Like Cincinnati Observatory, my gosh, Cincinnati beautifully restored recently among the most historic observatories in the United States. It's a spectacular place. So um, uh, the organization got slowed down, didn't it, uh, by the pandemic. Um, but still, uh, things are picking up and a lot mm -hmm. of thought is going into it. And uh, the folks who uh, founded it, including the affiliates like the Antique Telescope Society, uh, I think we're, is going to be described as an affiliate of this organization. Mm -hmm. And other uh, certain educational enterprises will be affiliated with this. Um, um, it's going to be an exciting time. And I think they're, uh, the, 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 the founding members will uh, make up their minds how to uh, structure things. And we're going to have continuing meetings, including um, the next face-to-face -face meeting is anticipated to be later this year at uh, Lowell Observatory, hosted by uh, the director there, Jeff Hall, who is among the people uh, present, of course, at, um, at, at the first event of, uh, at, at uh, Mount Wilson. So it'll be fun to continue to report on this and hopefully involve many interested people. I think it will be an exciting opportunity for historical preservation, but historical inspiration too yes. in, a, in sharing that. And there's a lot of opportunity for amateur astronomers for this type of thing, historical preservation, uh, to be a, a, a field unto, into, unto itself in amateur astronomy. It's just one of those things. Um, and I've got a lot of friends who, who are into it. And I hope we'll have more before long. So maybe with those words said, unless you can think of something else, Scott, that we should cover that I've overlooked to say in this improvisation, we should invite uh, Kevin to get involved and tell us about some of the things uh, uh, exciting happening at Lowell Observatory. Can you think of anything else I should have said? No, before there's going to be there's going to be more stuff to say, and and so I'm going to ask you to come back many more times because we, we can't say it all. Yeah, <laughs> and one yeah. deal I, because I it's talk a lot. I, I, no, I, I, but I, it's I, it's I, wonderful. I, it's wonderful, I, and uh, there there's so many stories to tell. So many aspects of this that are really important to communicate. And um, so uh, I'm just really happy that uh, uh, we are uh, have a renewed focus on getting some things accomplished. And a lot of that, of course, has to do with the pandemic kind of lightening up a bit. So um, so I, I will let you introduce uh, Mr. Kevin Schindler. Well, yes, um, Kevin is with us today and I uh, first met Kevin, I believe, at a historical symposium, must have been, oh, uh, nine or 10 years ago at uh, Lowell Observatory, there's Kevin, um, that related to the discovery of the uh, expansion of the universe. Because among the many historical accomplishments at Lowell Observatory, were uh, early observations of the red shifts of the galaxies. And so there was a fabulous uh, symposium there focusing on this. And there were historians present, I think from all over the world. And I, it seems to me that Lowell among maybe all the great 
early American observatories, Lowell is making a particularly wonderful effort to recognize uh, and, and share um, its, its history. And that's why they have Kevin as a, 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 a chief historian and public information officer at Lowell Observatory. And I just want to take the opportunity to uh, hold up because I'm so proud to have a copy of it. If I, let's see. Okay. Uh, I hope you could kind of see it. My lighting is terrible. But among Kevin's uh, uh, contributions was in recent years, this really great book, The Far End of the Journey, Lowell Observatory's 24-inch Clark Telescope. And I'm telling you, as a, as a past president of Antique Telescope Society, I really like books like this. It's lavishly illustrated, just fabulous. And, uh, uh, and I didn't know about it till I attended that uh, uh, a symposium. And I just thought I would hold it up so other people would know about it too. But any fellow telescope nut would really like to have that book if you haven't heard about it. But Kevin, there are so many things. You have an, a, an amazing new um, observational astronomy uh, facility, a gigantic roll off roof with multiple telescopes, new telescopes. You are catering to, to hands-on observing um, to the general public in the most fabulous way. Uh, Lowell in recent years, has built a, 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 a uh, history preservation and archive uh, a center that uh, we were very impressed to see at that uh, symposium. Um, and so there's, and it, there's just such a strong culture of education outreach at Lowell's research facility. It's very impressive. So I, was, I think I should stifle myself and encourage you, Kevin, to um, uh, share whatever you would like to about what's going on. And I think everybody here should know about at Lowell in Flagstaff, Arizona. Hey, John, I don't, I don't know. You're doing a great job here. I'm just enjoying listening to you talking about it. And it's, it's really a pleasure to be here to see so many friends um, and re really gods of the astronomy world. I'm really honored to be able to be part of this. And, and that goes beyond that. I'm honored to be part of Lowell Observatory. Today is actually my 27th anniversary. Oh, I've been wow. Here. So I'm no longer wow. a newcomer anymore. <laughs> but I've been here a while and I started as an educator. And then through the years, um, was able to avoid pink slips and now serve as um, the historian and public information officer. And, and the historian part is, you know, for me, it's kind of carrying on founder Percival Lowell's idea, you know, that doing science is why the observatory was founded. But the founder, Percival Lowell said, you know, what's the point of doing that unless we inspire and excite non-scientists, um, which mm -hmm. is exactly what, what this global star party is doing. So it really fits in with that theme. And so, so for my part, I, I'm able to, you know, dabble in writing some books and stuff just to try to promote it you know, we have, we get 100,000 visitors a year, and that number is going to be exploding over the next few years. And so to be able to give them something to remember their visit um, is really kind of a nice thing for me. Um, and I think a, a special thing about Lowell, John, you've really hit on it, and Dave Eicher has talked about this also. Um, Dave, who's, who's um, called America's, called Lowell America's Observatory before, because it's this personality here and it's this heritage that um, goes back 130 years of research but also this this idea of inspiring people the public we don't want to be the ivory towers up on the hill looking down on everybody we want to share this excitement and and so that's why I think the observatory is so special plus by the way you know we're still doing cutting edge research that's still the driving force here and what I want to do is uh, I'll start a program. I want to show some pictures of things that John, you had uh, mentioned our collection center for our historic stuff. And then we'll also um, look at that new observing plaza called the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. And then also just mention a little bit about, about the research that's going on here. Um, so I'd like to think that I'm pressing the right button here. And 
you should see a picture with some pine trees. Does that sound right? Yes, nice, it's good. Okay, so if you come up to the observatory, you see a lot of stuff when you first get here. Visitor Center, uh, this building is on the far side of the Visitor Center um, called the Putnam Collection Center. And in fact, as we speak, just behind this building, our new visitor facility is being constructed. And that mm -hmm. opens in 2024. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but it has six times the square footage of our current visitor center because we, we're bursting at the seams because visitation is so great. Wow. Um, but this is our Putnam Collection Center. And if we look at this, this went up several years ago. Um, on the left side are offices. In the middle is an exhibit area for visitors. And then on the right side, and then in kind of the back, is um, our science library and then our collections of artifacts and, all, and archives and such. Um, kind of, if you walk in, you can't miss oh, this wow. in the lobby. This is Percival Lowell's car, our founder's car. And like so many things at Lowell, there's a great story about how when Percival Lowell died, this car disappeared. Decades later, the owner, not knowing he was the owner of Percival Lowell's car, drove in Flagstaff. One of the old-time astronomers recognized the car and a couple of years later, our current trustee bought it for a lot more than Percival Lowell originally paid for it. <laughs> so <laughs> this still sit, this sits in our lobby. We bring it out a couple of times a year for, for parades. We still drive it around. And so it's it's kind of, I think that, that part of personnel, the personality of Lowell Observatory is not just the science and it's the personalities and the people, people lived up here. There's still houses up here where, where staff live. Um, and so you really capture this. I think it's something that resonates with the public, even those not necessarily interested in astronomy, that these are people doing this stuff. Um, it's Mars red. It's Mars it red. This yeah. is big red, as he calls it. Yep. And the restoration of it is just that remarkable. Gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that, that's the one side. This is a pretty drab looking picture, but it's not quite as depressing as it looks. These are um, our science library, which is one of the few things that's not expanding because Journals are now digital uh, for the most part, but we have um, a lot of our publications in here, but we're also planning on putting something else kind of in the backside of this building. And that's um, photographic plates. We've got about 35,000 35, glass plates, nothing close to Harvard and some other places, but it's enough to where, you know, they're in a basement where the water leaks. And on the left, all these white envelopes, the top couple shelves, are plates that Clyde Tombaugh took in his search for uh, Planet X. And then the bottom, the bottom ones on the left are uh, plates taken decades later as part of proper motion survey. And so um, uh, one of our astronomers, Stephen Levine, um, has gotten uh, some research funding to start scanning these. We're gonna start with the Planet X Pluto plates. Um, and scanning them means scanning both the envelopes and the plates, the plates have a lot of um, writing on them. So they'll scan them with the writing and then remove the writing so they're in their original state and scan them that way. Um, and then transport the plate over to the collection center. Um, so this is a, a pretty big project, um, and, but it's, it's starting now. And, it, and it's, it's possible because we have this collection center. Um, there are not a lot of observatories yet, at least that have a center devoted to preservation as John mentioned. So we're really fortunate to have that. Um, mm. And I can't tell you how many years it's gonna take a while, but eventually all of our artifacts and glass plates and um, documents and such will be in the collection center. Um, so, so that's one phase of the observatory is preserving this heritage um, that, that we have here. And it's a heritage that continues today, the research that's going on today. Now, John, you mentioned um, this new observing plaza, and this this is this is cool. This is just really cool. This is I'm going to show a couple of diagrams just to show how it works. We opened this in the fall of 2019, so this is a diagram of the building closed. The building has two parts: this big hangar and this smaller part to the left. Um, and inside are six telescopes. When you open it up, you slide that that whole building back and you have six um, telescopes. And I, I have another picture, an actual picture of it. But these telescopes, this isn't like a research 
telescope like the 24 inch refractor that was adapted for the public use. These are designed specifically for the public. So several of the telescopes, um, the mounts can be raised or lowered with the push of a button and the telescope stays focused on the object. So if we have somebody in a wheelchair, for instance, we can lower it uh, without them trying to stand up and that sort of thing. So this was really designed um, for public use. Um, here's a nighttime shot. And um, I'll just kind of tell you what telescopes are here because it's a wide variety. Um, over in the corner, kind of out of sight here, it's a five, five and a half inch F7 wide field reflector. Um, then we've got a um, this, maybe the coolest looking one, this retro Victorian looking um, eight inch Moonraker. Um, great for looking at planetary stuff, that's an F12. Um, we've got two plane waves that are kind of in the back here, 17 and 14 inch. And those mm. are both attached to monitors so that we wanna have visitors be able to maintain that really cool one-on-one -on -one experience of you know, looking through an eyepiece and being connected to the cosmos. But also with the monitors, we could have one of our astronomers show an object they study um, and get several people around and teach. So it allows us to do several different things. And the biggest telescope here is this 32 inch um, star structure. And that's actually technically the largest telescope on Mars Hill now. So we opened this in the fall of 2019 and here is the opening event. It was in conjunction with um, a festival of science we do here in Flagstaff. It's the oldest festival of science in the country or one of the oldest. Um, and, and helping us open it was in the middle, Charlie Duke and his wife, um, Dot. And I think Dave Iker, I think you're in here somewhere because you were here for this, I'm pretty sure. Um, so we opened this as part of this event. And in fact, during that, I was able to present Charlie Duke with an asteroid discovered here at the observatory that wow. was named in his honor. So that was a pretty, you know, the nerd shot here. Um, so we opened it in the fall of 2019 and we got really excited. We're looking forward to spring break for 2020 when we'd really put it to use. And that's when COVID hit and we ended up closing on, um, on uh, March 13th, which would have been Percival, which was Percival Lowell's birthday. So we ended oh. up celebrating our founder's birth by, by closing the place. Um, but luckily two years later, we're fully back reopened, um, no restrictions or anything like that. Um, another part of this expansion of the visitor experience is a new 24 inch plane wave. Um, and this is in a dome behind the 24 inch Clark. Um, there used to be a 16 inch Bowler and Shivens in here that had come mm -hmm. from Northwestern. And there are a lot of software and hardware issues. Um, and the plane wave, we've had, we have several plane waves being used at our interferometer as well as on site here. And they're just, they're just so robust and great for the public. And so, so this, is, this is kind of phase two of this expansion of the visitor program because we've, right before COVID, we were getting 100,000 plus visitors and there's nowhere to park. Um, the parking is not big enough. There's not enough places to, you know, for things to do for people. So having this telescope in conjunction with the refract 24 inch refractor plus the open deck observatory allows us to reach a lot more people. And then the last phase of this in 2024, um, we're opening this new astronomy discovery center. Wow. Um, six times the square footage of the current facility. It's got um, three stories. The top story is just so cool. Part of it, you know, we've talked about having maybe a planetarium here, but Flagstaff has the world's first lining ordinance established in 1958. And it's also the world's first international dark sky city. We, we got the real stuff here. Um, and so we're creating this sort of open planetarium in which we have heated seats and people can sit back and look at the stars um, with our educators and astronomers. Um, so that's gonna be a, a pretty unique feature of this that we're excited about. And the heated seats, cause it does get pretty chilly here in Flagstaff. Um, this is the construction site just about a week ago. Um, they haven't done much since then cause we've had some snow, but you can see um, this is the backside of the collection center. So the visitor center would be to the left off the screen. And you can see the perimeter of the main facility and then the new parking area will be back here. So John, when you come here, 
um, for the Alliance um, later this year, you'll see this is going to be going vertical. You'll see it'll be moving along nicely. Wow. And also point, it, it's really, it's exciting because it, it really allows us to not only accommodate more people, but of course, we're going to have state-of-the-art exhibits and displays in there also. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. And then I thought one, one final thing is we've been talking about preserving the heritage here, um, you know, the heritage of discovery and sharing that heritage with the public. But of course, the heritage is still being built. You know, what happened before? VM Slifer's um, observations of the redshift and this Clyde Tombaugh's discovery of Pluto and um, Robert Burnham, you know, he, he, he wrote the Celestial Handbook in his off time while he was working here on the proper motion survey. Um, he had a lot of spare time, but he, he did that all in his spare time. Jeez. These are so many great stories here, but the story is still being created. Yeah, and so, it's not over. No, this is, this is the little Discovery Telescope, um, 4.3 meter. Um, and to give you an idea of size with some people, um, this, these are some people, this is just a couple of weeks ago. Um, every February, we hold a festival call, called I Heart Pluto, where we're celebrating Pluto's legacy um, leading up to the 100th anniversary of Pluto discovery in 2030. Um, our, we had some, a keynote panel this year, including Don Johansson, who discovered the fossil hominid Lucy back in 1974. Um, Kathy Olkin, who works up at Swery, is involved with the Lucy mission. Um, Will Grundy, many of you know, um, one of our planetary scientists uh, involved with New Horizons. <laughs> and, you know, we talked about, we're talking about amateur telescopes. Um, on this night, this was an engineering night when it was closed so they could do some, you know, maintenance and such. So they were able to put an eyepiece on one of the instruments. So we had a 4.3 meter um, telescope with an eyepiece to look at. Um, wow. Which was, I, I don't know, I, I needed a cigarette afterwards and I don't smoke. It was just really cool. <laughs> so um, every once in a while we're able to do this sort of thing. And, yeah. it, and, and so mostly it's, it's doing research and I'll just end with this, this, the powerful thing about this telescope is this cube here that holds five different instruments. So instead of having, let's say, a, you know, a spectrograph on there, it has to be, you know, you spend a day taking it off, putting another instrument on. Um, these five instruments, you can push a button and the whole wheel spins. And within about half a minute, you can be change the light path and, and be using a different instrument. Oh, wow. So if we, it's fast. you know, a last of the minute comet, David discovers comet, we decide to study it through the telescope. We can study it with almost simultaneously with several different instruments, um, which is really efficient. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so it's really, it's really Super pretty cool. productive. And John, you said you talk a lot. I'm doing the same thing. So I, I, I didn't take a breath or so I will now. And I'll. Oh, I'll Kevin, you. no, this, this has been uh, wonderful and ideal. It's so obvious to everyone that Lowell is setting a standard for uh, so many uh, levels of achievement for how other observatories ought to be thinking uh, with a big picture for public education and science uh, advocacy. Um, it's so fortunate that you all there have the freedom to pursue this because I fear that uh, too many other institutions sort of wrapped up in a very different sort of institutional culture just don't have the freedom to uh, uh, to uh, to have the hundred thousand visitors per year that you 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 you, you have. So it's That's very very exciting. It's more, I, I learned things I did not realize about what's going on there right now. I am more excited than ever to get back again, and I'm lucky because I think it's only about a four hour drive um, between my place and yours. And I'm just telling you, next time you're having an engineering run on that big telescope, <laughs> um, oh, God, boy, I'm going to be harassing you. I so need, thank you. Need... Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, thank you, Scott, for um, thank you. facilitating these things. 
And uh, it's really, really fun to share with everybody present. So uh, thanks a lot, folks. Yeah, thank you for all the inspiration and the, you know, the information of, uh, you know, what uh, history means in, in uh, you know, recent history uh, means in, in our world today and, in, in, uh, you know, science, scientific literacy. Uh, so it's, um, you know, it's a pleasure to know that uh, uh, Lowell is uh, really setting some amazing standards. One of the people in the audience was Ian McLennan, uh, who was watching, and uh, he says hello to you, Kevin. Um, but uh, Ian, Ian and Bill Peters were involved in the design of the Giovanni Outdoor, um, uh, you know, observatory center that's out there. And I, stuff. I don't want to un underestimate Ian's and Bill's involvement because they're also large, hugely involved with the development of the Discovery Center. And their involvement really allowed Lowell to escalate the scale of what we do by, by bringing them in and showing, you know, we have a lot of smart people here yes. at the observatory, like a lot of places, but not the know-how. And, and Ian and Bill have brought that in. And it's just, it's always inspiring to see the ideas they come up with. And yes. thinking, they, hey, they're, they're doing this for us. How cool right. is that? Those guys are best of breed of what they do. That's for sure. They, they, they are also intimately involved with um, consulting for U Yerkes Future Foundation. And right. as your, which Yerkes Observatory uh, for so many uh, decades, a century, uh, owned and managed by the University of Chicago. And my wife and I both worked there for years. Uh, but now it's owned by Yerkes Future Foundation. And very fortunately, um, uh, 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 under the wise guidance of our friends in Canada, you've just mentioned. So a lot of, lot of good things going on now and things to be happy about. So there. And yeah. I'll, just, I'll just say one final thought. When, you know, one of the things about Lowell is, you know, not wanting to be, you know, an isolated place. We want partnerships and that means bringing in the best people. One of our advisory board members is Dave Iker, who's on with us. And David has done so much to, again, to help us think of the observatory in different ways that allows us to really expand our reach, both in science and outreach. And right on. Kevin, just to add one quick thing, if I may, you know, I've been to a lot of places all around the world in various areas of history and of science. There's nowhere on earth like Lowell Observatory that has the blend of the incredible history of, of Percival Lowell, of Clyde Tombaugh, of the Slifers, of everything, and the current research that's going on and the resurgence that's going on there of promoting knowledge and the science and the astronomy and the active research and the history. It's an amazing a unique institution and and Kevin it's I'm proud to be your pal and and it's a great thing to have you on tonight I hope you'll you'll be back on talking about this and what's going on at the observatory a lot more on these things in the future absolutely yeah. yeah we'll be hitting you up for sure Kevin so thank I'll, you I'll mention the, the last time Dave was in town we visited um the Slifer graves at the yeah. local cemetery oh, wow. and paid homage to them and since then I've found the graves of Stanley Sykes also who was a major instrument maker here in the early days. Cool. Very cool. Yep, and their inspiration lives on. So thank you very much, uh, Kevin and John. And, um, uh, you know, I look forward to more of these kinds of, uh, you know, inspirational talks. Thanks very much. Okay, so up next, um, we have uh, Kareem Jaffer. He is the uh, uh, with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, uh, the Montreal Center. He's also a professor of astronomy at John Abbott College. Uh, he is a powerhouse of astronomy outreach, and uh, he is uh, a favorite on uh, Global Star Party, uh, you know, and so we're always honored to have him on. I, I have not been counting, Kareem, but how many Global Star Parties have you attended? Do you, do you um, remember? Good question. I, I know it's the vast majority since last May, but I don't have a number. I, I think I'm yeah. going to have to go back through and figure that out. I, I, I think it's probably around 20 or so. so. I, I still, you know, I, I'm in awe of you and David with how, not not just the, 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 the consistency of the content and how much effort you guys put in, but just 
how motivating you are for all of us who are, you know, getting a chance to spend a Tuesday oh. evening with you every week. It's just, it's, it's one of the highlights of my week. Yeah, me too. Me too. So I, I get the energy from, from uh, people like yourself and, uh, and certainly from the audience. And so it's, it's great, uh, you know, to be back here and connect the wires, uh, so to speak. And, and, uh, and to uh, be backstage with you guys. So, so anyways, I will turn this over to you, Kareem. Thank you for awesome. coming back on again. My pleasure. And sorry I missed last week. It was uh, unavoidable, but I'm glad Russell was able to join. Uh, yep. We have uh, some fun for tonight because with uh, John and Kevin coming on and the topic of reflections of the universe, I decided that I would do a little bit on the historical uh, observatories of Canada. And so I'm going to just share with you a few bits of insight on our end, and uh, hopefully we can at some point find ourselves seated at the same table with uh, with all these amazing observers. Lowell, I'm just, I'm in awe. I, I need to get down there. Mount Wilson, Lowell, I need to do the road trip at some point soon. Um, Palomar, I, 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 Yerkes, I mean, I, I just think I need to get in my car and drive for a year. I think that's what I need to find the time to do. But for tonight, we're going to be chatting about reflections of the universe. Before we do, I just wanted to mention that uh, our Astro Radio show from yesterday is up on astroradio.earth. It was so much fun. We got to talk about all the current things happening in space and astronomy, uh, what's the current topics, and especially at this point, we're chatting a lot about James Webb Space Telescope. And that's kind of key because we have a lot of topics coming up on the James Webb that I want to share with you. But first, this past weekend, we had Earth Hour. And if you didn't get a chance to celebrate Earth Hour, pick any hour, one night, just turn everything off, be in the dark, go outside, and get to enjoy a little bit of the night skies. Now, here in Montreal, the most of the week this week, the night sky is gray. And uh, there's, you know, some cold. We had minus 20 two days ago, and we're back up to positives, and then we're back down to minus tomorrow and freezing rain. So we don't get to see the stars too much, but tonight there should be stars. So I'm hoping to pop out there in a little bit and at least, you know, wave hi to the ISS as it passes over or something like that. But we had a fantastic event. It's available on our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash RASC Montreal. And uh, our two speakers were Tim Doucette and Lisa Ann Fanning. Now, Lisa Ann is going to join us at a Global Star Party coming up soon. And she's based out of New Jersey, but a member of the RASC Halifax Center. Tim Doucette runs an astrotourism site in Nova Scotia in the dark skies. And I was just yeah, I was in awe. I, my jaw dropped. I think I need to go out there as well. So I need to go east. I need to go south. I need to go west. You know, I definitely need to spend a year in the car at some point soon. Coming up for the RAC Montreal Centre, like I said, James Webb is on our mind. So uh, in a couple of weeks, we have one of the students at the University of Montreal here in Montreal at IREX, the Institute for Research on Exoplanets, whose project was chosen as one of the first year projects for the James Webb Space Telescope. So Olivia Lim is a PhD student, but submitted her project and was chosen as the lead researcher to study exoplanet signatures of the atmospheres for the TRAPPIST-1 system. So she's going to share that with us. You can register in advance at bit.ly slash JWST April 9. It's uh, on Saturday, April 9th, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. It is a webinar. And we also are really excited because with the Artemis mission now, you know, Artemis 1 is out on the launch pad. It's ready to go through some tests. It will be launching soon. Our RASC has partnered with the Canadian Space Agency, and we are doing a series of events to celebrate Artemis. The first one is going to be on Thursday, April 14th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Bettina Forger, who's a local artist, a past president of the Montreal Centre, and the program director for the artist in residence program at SETI. She's going to be leading us in a lunar sketching workshop, which is one of the things she's done with my students in the past. Crater sketching is just such a fantastic way to observe the moon and to really see and understand the details of the craters and get a feel for the formation of those craters. We also are planning our May 7th International Astronomy Day. We're going to be doing a daytime event at our local Rio Tinto Alcan Planetarium. We're going to be doing a live stream with RASC National across the entire country. We're going to have centers join in from across the country, sharing a little bit of a look up towards the night sky and hopefully towards the, the first quarter moon on Saturday, May 7th. 
I also wanted to mention that the cosmic generation is still running really strong. I am so in awe of these youth and what they're putting together. Their next event is also in the James Webb Space Telescope. It's on Sunday, April 10th at 3 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time, 2 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, it's going to be one of the youth members, a Cosmic Generation Ambassador, Dalali, who's going to be sharing a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope, what makes it so unique, how the whole unfolding process occurred, what types of instrumentation is in there. And when we're talking about reflections of the universe, that 18 mirror assembly, those first images have just really set the bar. If you, if you read a little bit about the level of precision that James Webb is showing, now it's in the early stages, we're still doing calibrations, but the fine guidance sensors that were built in Montreal that were used to align these 18 mirrors appear to have reached maximum resolution as allowed for by the laws of physics. So when you talk about wave behavior and the way in which signals interfere with each other, the maximum resolution you can get is what we've been able to get off of that first calibration image we've got from the James Webb Space Telescope. So that's kind of the direction I wanted to go with tonight, because when when Scott said reflections, and I mentioned it to my wife, she immediately said, so are you going to ponder philosophical? Are you going to go into the metaphysics of reflections? And I said, no, you know what? I'm going to take this literally. And I literally want to talk about our reflections of the universe from up here in Canada. So I started doing a little bit more background research beyond what I've done with my students to really dive into what were the first observations of the night sky in Canada. And we were lucky. I brought in back last fall a couple of guests who actually shared a little bit of the bookend of the first to the first really uh, rigorous observations in Canada. And the first Canadian observations, in fact, were done all the way back during the founding of this country. And it shouldn't be, sorry, it shouldn't be 1947. It should be uh, 1447, my apologies. But John Cabot was the discoverer of Newfoundland and Jacques Cartier in 1534 started exploring the St. Lawrence River. And both of those explorers took observations that seemed to indicate that there likely was some astronomical uh, material, some astronomical instrumentation being used. However, there's no definite, reliable source that says that they did have sextants, that they did have any sort of device to measure latitude based on the North Star. But in 1603, Samuel de Champlain, the founder of Quebec, actually had records of latitude and altitude of locations visited throughout his setup of towns and villages throughout Quebec. And so we know for sure that there must have been astronomical tools being used. And in 1618, we had Jesuit colonies come from France, and they sent back notes about the whole setup of their observations and of, of their communities here in the New World. And they included in those astronomical observations. There were comets that they observed. There were eclipses that they mentioned, especially a couple of lunar eclipses, which were fantastically detailed in these notes. So all the way back in the late 1500s, early 1600s, we had observations happening in Canada. But what about observatories? What about actual locations to take reliable measurementation in order to understand the universe? The first Canadian observatories, from what we can tell, happened in 1750. The Jesuit priest Joseph-Pierre de Bonnecamp uh, in the College of Quebec and the Marquis de Coglin in the Fortress of Louisbourg both of those individuals set up small observatory shacks where they put a lot of the astronomical instruments that they brought over from Europe. In 1765, we had Castle Frederick in Nova Scotia that had its own location, high altitude obs obs observing deck that they used to take measurements. And in 1850, an observatory was founded in Quebec City, which is just about three hours from here in Montreal. Now, these first observatories were mostly wooden shacks where instrumentation was kept and brought out as needed. They weren't open domes, they weren't anything along those lines. But they also weren't really reflections, because if we think about it, the topic today is not refractions of the universe, it's reflections of the universe. So mm -hmm. we can't go quite that far back in history if we want to talk about that. And Randall Rosenfeld, who came on in, uh, in uh, 
GSP-71, he's been working on our Dorner Telescope Museum, and he talked a lot about when we switched over from refractors to reflectors here in Canada. And when we start talking about reflectors, the majority of the first ones used were of the model of the Newtonian reflector, something very small, very easy to use, not something very large or elaborate. And then some of the astronomers and some of the meteorologists, especially at that time, started to build more and more elaborate apparatus. And in Global Star Party 73, Laurie Roche led us to our discussion of the first time Canada really took the stage when it came to these reflecting telescopes and observatories. And that's the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory in Victoria, British Columbia. Mm. Now, this Dominion Astrophysical Observatory was the home of the 73-inch Plaskett Telescope. This was being designed and built at the same time as the 100-inch Hooker was being built in Mount Wilson. And in fact, the 100-inch beat the 73-inch Plaskett for first light. The difference is the 100-inch had first light earlier, I believe in late 1917, but it wasn't until late 1918 that it actually opened for continuous use for research. Because in between there, because of the First World War, there were a lot of supply issues and a lot of demand on the individuals that would have otherwise been tasked to run the telescope. And so there was nobody there to reliably run it. So the Hooker telescope didn't actually start being used continuously until late 1918. So for a couple of months in 1918, the largest telescope in the world was being used was in Victoria, BC, just a little bit larger than the Leviathan over in uh, over across the pond. Now, it would be great to have a story of how, you know, this Plaskett telescope, it is still being used for research. It's been refurbished. We saw the old mirror when Lori gave us our walkthrough of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory and the so-called center of the universe, the area run by the friends of the Dominion. Unfortunately, that friends of the Dominion and the public side of this closed down many years ago. And it was the RASC Victoria Center that has actually started that back up and started running events there pre-COVID. So the the research side of the Astrophysical Observatory still going. The public side of it has now fallen on the amateur astronomers, the RASC Victoria Center, and they've taken it under the wing and really put some fantastic programming together. They have a wonderful program coming up for International Astronomy Day, including a talk by Chris Gaynor, who's one of our past presidents at the RASC National, and he wrote the, the Hubble anniversary book for the 30-year Hubble that's available on the NASA website. As the David or as the uh, Dominion Astrophysical Observatory was coming into action and really starting to set a stage for the level to which astronomy was being done in Canada, David Dunlop over in Ontario decided to do one better. So if they could have a 73 inch, he was going to have a 74 inch. So he designed a 74 inch telescope in Toronto that then became the largest telescope in Canada to be used. The actual observatory is incredible because what he did was he had the entire observatory designed and first built in Newcastle upon Tyne over in the UK. And then they dismantled it once it was all operational and moved it over to Canada piece by piece to be able to build it all together here. And in 1935, when it opened, this was the lineup that you had. Wow. So this was the amount of public attention that this telescope got. At that time, this telescope was the second largest in the entire world in use. The third was the Plaskett, which was just one and a half inches smaller, uh, and then followed by the Perkins and the Oak Ridge. Now, this telescope was used for really amazing research. Part of the research was 1972, the very first black hole ever identified, Cygnus X1, was identified in Toronto at the David Dunlop Observatory. Oh, wow. Now, you remember the story from the Dominion where the public side of it kind of fell off a bit while the research side kept going and the public side closed down and the RASC stepped up and the local center has taken it over. Well, the same thing unfortunately happened at the David Dunlop. The David Dunlop was partly being run by the city, partly being run by an independent uh, entity, and there was a lot of use being made from the University of Toronto astrophysicists and astronomers. When the private entity kind of started closing things up because there really wasn't any money being made from this, 
the University of Toronto and the RASC Toronto Centre both stepped forward and helped to refurbish the telescope and add a public element. So now, pre-COVID, we had evening events here a couple of times a week, mm. large, large gatherings sold out every month. And now as COVID regulations and COVID precautions are starting to be lifted, the David Dunlap is starting to be used again. And so if you ever come out to Toronto or out to Victoria, I highly suggest that you visit these couple of observatories. I could also, you know, for a while there, I thought I'd start talking about Mont Megantic and a few other observatories here in Quebec, but I wanted to stick to some of the milestones that we've seen in astronomy and in the reflections of the universe. And Canada has led the way in one particular area, and that's in radio observation. The first big radio observatory was built just outside of Ottawa, and it was built and opened in 1959 with a small parabolic dish while a larger one was being built, and a 46-meter parabolic mirror was completed in 1966. And the person who led this whole push and was the first director of the Algonquin Radio Observatory was Covington, and Covington was our first radio astronomer. He was the one who detected the radio signals coming from sunspot behavior from the sun back in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And he made those observations at a small facility just outside of Ottawa. Now, Ottawa was starting to grow at that time, which meant that there were more and more stray radio signals. So the need for a better location for the Algonquin Radio Observatory was really, you know, it, it just fed off because that yellow line you see going along the top there that's the Trans-Canadian Highway. That takes us through Sudbury, all the way out west, all the way out to BC, through mountains, through large, large ranges of prairies. And when you take a look at this map and you get an idea for how far everything is, like this is just from Milwaukee to Montreal. And if you go three times that distance, you'll get to the western coast of Canada. So the Algonquin Radio Observatory was basically our premier spot for radio observations in Canada. But on the West Coast, we had a second radio observatory near the Dominion, but this one was in Penticton, BC. So this was actually inland, not on Victoria Island. And in 1968, just after the Algonquin Radio Dish opened, the dish in BC and the dish in Algonquin completed the very first long-distance interferometry. This created effectively a 3,000 kilometer radio telescope. This is the same technology that was used for the Event Horizon Telescope to take a picture of a black hole just a couple of years ago. So it was first pioneered in Canada. And the push was to try to do this because we knew that there were other competing groups all across the world trying to do this, but most interferometry at that time was limited to the speed at which signals could be sent back and forth between two observatories without the signal being degraded. What Dominion and Algonquin did is they both had atomic clocks that had been synchronized before being shipped to the two locations. So those atomic clocks on videotape placed clock timings during all observational periods so that when you brought the two videotapes together in the same location, which was at the time the Astrophysical Institute, you could then combine them knowing that you were looking at the exact same measurement at the exact same time, 3,000 kilometers apart. Nowadays, the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory looks much, much better. You know, it's much bigger parabolic dish, fully steerable, just like the one in Algonquin, and just a touch smaller. I believe this one's a 42 meter now. But what's really amazing about the Dominion Radio Observatory is they've gone to the next level. You will have heard of CHIME. CHIME is this beautiful set of curved radio dishes that are now finding these fast galactic bursts of radio waves that's leading us to a whole new version uh, or a whole new era of astrophysics research and, and observational radio astronomy. So the Canadian history of a lot of these observatories is a really rich one. And if you find yourself in Canada, whether it's in BC, whether it's in Ontario, or whether it's in Quebec, and you can come and we'll take you to Mount Megantic, and we'll show you the McGill old observatory, the new one, and we'll even show you our small one here in the RAC Montreal Centre. There's a lot to be seen for the historic observatories here in Canada. Scott, back to you. Wow, that's impressive. That's impressive. You're, you're inspiring me to go up to Canada and get uh, get the uh, VIP tour of uh, some of these observatories. I'd love that. You we know, definitely have to get got, you up here. Yeah. We got to right. plan the trip. Yeah. 
So, uh, Kareem, thank you so much. That's great. Um, uh, looking forward to having you back. Um, our, uh, our next speaker is young Navin Sentil Kumar and his special guest. And they're going to talk about, I think, the same subject about reflections. So, Navin, you want to come on? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm um, Navin. Um, I brought my, uh, my one of my friends. His name is Sugi. Sugi, can you um, it, turn on your camera and please introduce yourself? Uh, hello. Uh, wait a second. Okay, cool. Uh, hello, I'm Sugi. And I did the presentation with Naveen. <laughs> Great. Okay, so, cool, so we're just going to share a screen. Okay, yeah. Okay, so this is our presentation about reflections. Uh, Sugi, so Sugi's gonna take this one. Okay, so Sugi, can you start um like a? Yeah. So, what is reflection? Reflection is when light gets bounced back from a surface. There are two types of reflection. We'll cover these in detail in this presentation. Uh, diffuse reflection. This is the most important type of reflection. This type of reflection lets us see colors and light from objects. This happens when a light when an object absorbs light but reflects a certain light more. Example, an apple is red because it absorbs all light except for red light and our eyes see the light reflecting off it. Specular reflection. Specular reflection is the reflection of light in one angle. It is in and out. It has two obtuse angles it happens when a uh, light goes in in a way and then it gets reflected the opposite way and this is basically how mirrors work hmm. so things that reflect light almost everything on earth reflects light Black holes in empty space do not reflect any light. Black holes take up all the light and they don't reflect anything because they can absorb all light. Only certain objects do specular reflection. This occurs in mostly smooth and metallic objects, but liquids can also make specular reflections. You can look at a puddle and you can see reflections. Reflector telescope. The telescope uses specular reflection since it has mirrors. And this will be a way for you to see at an angle. So the light will go into a way and then it will bounce off a mirror. And then it, the mirror that bounces off will be concave so it can focus all the light into a flat mirror that's angled, and then that'll send the light to the eyepiece and you can see what you're looking at. So diffuse reflection is, it's basically everything on earth. <laughs> because everything you can see is an effect of diffuse reflection. The 
specular reflection occurs on mirrors and metals. Oh, thank you. That's all. Well, thank you, guys. That's great. Um, uh, your, uh, your presentations uh, are getting better every time, and I uh, really enjoy um, you guys rising to the challenge of, uh, you know, the uh, uh, theme of the program. And, um, you know, when you, uh, when you apply reflections and uh, the way that light works, you know, these were all principles that were studied in depth by Isaac Newton and, of course, uh, still studied intensely today. So that's, uh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you so I, much. I have a question. Yes. I have a question. Uh, yes. uh, a wonderful presentation. Where are you uh, young men speaking from? This, both from the D.C. metro area. That's, that's great. Uh, yeah. Optics is a wonderful, interesting branch of physics. There's optics and there's optical engineering. And uh, those of us who have grown up uh, with, with amateur astronomy, we love everything about telescopes. We can't help it. And it's, it's part of the, the fun is not just learning about astronomy, but learning how telescopes work. And uh, you both are, are on that path. Many people find optics so interesting, they just focus right on that. And there's so many things going on in optics, new things that I, for one, I don't know anything about, but I hear about them. So I think it's great to hear you. And I encourage you to continue to think about these interesting things and the beauty of light. It all has to do with managing light with optical parts. And it's all very beautiful. So thank you for the presentation. Yeah, no by the way, Scott, my dad wanted to thank you on um, helping him do a successful drift alignment. Oh yeah, well he he's a he's a natural, you know. So uh, I've I've helped many people do it, but uh, it's not often they do it the first time. So <laughs> and I wanted to say thank you as well. I think that was a wonderful, wonderful lecture that was just given, and it reminded me of my first telescope that I would like to show you now. This is a picture from the Montreal Star oh, taken wow. in 1962. And you see my first telescope is at the upper right on the picture there. And uh, that's taken over 60 years ago. So I thought you'd enjoy looking at it. Thank you. That's yeah. a great picture. Thanks. Uh, you'll have to scan that and uh... Let me have it for uh, some future presentation, David. I, I have just cool. done that, and I'll send it to you. Oh, I want me it. as well. That's... Me as well. <laughs> That's you right. Too. For everyone that would like a photo, <laughs> <laughs> a copy Help of me in on that. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Only okay. if it's autographed by David. We we need <laughs> an right. autograph, and you know. That's right. Yep, I have the autograph book, so that's another to add to my growing David collection. <laughs> right, right. Well, Adrian, how are you? Uh, we missed you on a Global Star Party, but you're back. And yes. um, yeah, so you've been busy. Yes, I had to take a uh, professional shooting gig. And um, it, was, uh, it was tiring, but it was fun. And I included one of the photos that I took that was already shared on social media from that event um, with filmmakers. Um, there were some interesting uh, films about space. I didn't get a chance to watch them all because I was going back and forth capturing the images that they wanted me to get. But I would have gladly reported on what some of the independent filmmakers thought of hmm. space. Um, one that I caught a glimpse of, some nebulas were shown mixed in with some interesting uh, imagery of, uh, of someone in space or floating around in space. And um, with experimental films, you never know which direction they're going to go. But um, so astronomy was a part of the film festival. Hopefully next year, I, I'll get a chance to actually watch a couple and then report on those. So um well, I'm back now, and yep. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, if I can remember how to do that. 
Uh, it's been a while. And of course, I'm wearing a um, low the brow hat, hat that I chose to wear is uh, for University Lowbrow Astronomers, which is one of the uh, astronomy groups I'm in. I'm also in the RASC uh, with Kareem. Thanks to Kareem, actually. And Adrian I, gave a talk to the uh, University Lowbrows this past uh, this month. Yes, it's a uh, there's a 10 minute slideshow that if I give that if I share that slideshow here, I'd have to take the sound down because I do have some music behind it. Um, I'll have to share the I'll have to share that slideshow. Um, I think some of it was recorded. But um, so the the discussion for tonight was reflections. So rather than end with a bird photo, I started with one, oh, Scott. A beautiful shot. Perfect uh, reflection of a great blue heron. Yeah. That I took beautiful. some time ago. So uh, Very serene. So, yep. Life on Earth. Of course, there's reflections. The photos that I've taken since being a part of, the, um, of this, the uh, Ann Arbor Film Festival, um, I don't have too many reflections other than just uh, personally reflecting on my experience shooting professionally here and um, looking forward to, you know, I don't get very many professional gigs. And to be honest, I do love shooting the night sky. So as soon as the last event was over, I did take a shot and I'll explain hmm. why the road is red. Did the experimental films get to me? Am I going to start doing some weird things with my photography? Not all the time. Um, as it turns out, the uh, road was light painted by a flashing red light behind me. And wow. with a 20 second exposure, there was enough of that red light flashing. And you can see where it reaches and kind of where the influence of that red light stops further up here. Where these trees are. And of course, it doesn't reach out into the cosmos. So. There's no additional red light on any of the stars. The area that we're viewing here, this is actually um, Corvus. This is Virgo. So we're looking and then Leo is buried within some of the uh, starlight over here. So this is, if you take a telescope to this region, plenty of galaxies and even a quasar, 3C273, three, three somewhere in this area, uh, maybe even next to this uh, spot that I have um, a little dust on the lens. Um, there, the quasar is, is pictured in this photograph of the uh, blood road below it. So maybe you know, I, when it comes to experimentation and astronomy, it's, it's, this was by accident. I, didn't actually think of the fact that the red light would paint itself into my long exposure. So I went a little further away and decided to do a little perspective. There's some weeds here. And here's M44, the beehive. Here's um, Pollux and Castor, the twins. And there's a larger tree in the background, but it's lost. This is... Um, Let's see, I believe Auriga is the name of the constellation, Charioteer, and over here is um, Pro Procyon and Canis Minor. The mm -hmm. other constellations are low to the ground. I gave it another shot and um, moved away a bit. Now uh, there's my one of my favorite larger trees. And look, clouds started to move in as if to welcome me back to imaging the night sky um mm -hmm. can't forget that in michigan there will be clouds but with nightscapes you can mix clouds and you can mix um you know you can mix your night sky imagery with clouds and still have as accurate as you can there's the oh, stars yeah. of the beehive that show up i always find it um impressive when in a 14 millimeter lens you can still capture you know data from larger star clusters pretty sure m35 would be around here somewhere if it weren't covered there's a there's actually i believe a star cluster here and one here i think is this that might be 
M35 right there, right here. The, mm -hmm. um, the star clusters appear as little small groupings of stars in when the detail of your nightscape is such that the star clusters can appear, you know that you've got pretty good focus. And I prefer those to, you know, I artistry, I do like it, but then I also like detail. So this is, this was actually Venus a couple of weeks ago and me attempting to image the rising core of the Milky Way, but the clouds had other ideas. The core would be here, but um, the clouds blocked it from view, leaving only this part during daybreak. So I thought I would try again in a different location. This is a raw photo before official astronomical twilight. You can't see very much, but there is some data. This is taken with um, a modified camera with a, I set the temperature to a cooler temperature, some 2700 Kelvin on a digital camera. Um, you know, that's the white balance. When you edit it, Milky Way appears. There's some noise reduction, some artistry here. And I was noticeably pink, even though some of the nebulosity here is real. Um, this is this is real. It's a part of uh, Ophiuchus. And here's a row of Fiucci. You can see, you can see the beginnings of that. Um, but some of the uh, features were washed out and I just I said, why not? I'll well, look at that. Going. Yeah, just... sometimes the noise reduction will do it. But that I ended up with that image. Here you have the North American and Pelican nebulas. Um, this nebula, which I should go, I really do owe myself, uh, go find out what some of what this nebula is so that I can, because I look for it as well when I look at the Cygnus region. And then here you've got the bulge in part of the center region where M17 and 18 Sagittarius cloud and in not pictured is M5, M20 and some of the NGC objects near the core. Yeah, I love the composition and the subtle yeah, range right. of colors there. Yeah, this one Very I beautiful. made a little more I left it a little pink because that's the, the HA regions that shooting with a modified camera affords you. You can see some of the regions. And if you notice, here are some of the stars of Sagittarius, mm -hmm. which is slowly rising. This was around 5.30 in the morning. And at 5.45, astronomical twilight was supposed to begin. Well, right before it, and of course, meteors appear. Now, some of these streaks could be satellites. This one, and I think this one, however, a meteor, usually the signature for meteors is you see the light, the line go um, faint and then grow in intensity. And I think I have another shot that has a definitive meteor in it. A lot of streaks in the sky that could be satellites. And I would I would uh, defer to David who um, observes to tell me whether these streaks he would believe are more satellites rather than meteors. I wouldn't be surprised if they were. Um, but I wanted to capture the distant, well, not so distant, but uh, off in the distance, the lake here. And then this part of the uh, Milky Way, which is rising and is now south and beginning to turn over as we rotate through it. Now, Milky Way season, for many imagers, this image represents Milky Way season. This is a meteor. I saw it as it entered the picture. This is a plane. And you can tell by the dots from the flashing light as the plane was flying through. Um, Milky Way season to me is year round. It just so happens that during um, during the spring and summer months, the bright core rises 
this bright core and this is the this is the part that makes its way into a lot of landscape astrophotography and nightscapers images this northern bulge we have folks from this, the southern hemisphere and of course they get to see what's on the other side where these trees are they'll see what's on the other side of this milky way the full bulge and um they also see the other southern parts the uh the southern parts then link up with the orion the part of the milky way that orion sits in and if you go around the globe it completes a full circle of what we can see from our home galaxy so we see different parts of it and there is from north american or northern hemisphere imagers there is a bit of a bias towards calling when we can see this milky way season beginning milky way season is year round you just have to go somewhere where you can image it no matter what time it, the milky way is always in the night sky and the fainter parts you just have to go somewhere a little darker or image for a little longer to see them so with that i will stop my share answer any questions that anyone most, may have mostly it's comments a, a beautiful milky way shot uh harold Locke says he's watching on youtube he says adrian i think you have made a significant jump in your landscape astrophotography well, um, thank you harold i know you're listening and harold's been one of those who's followed my work as it's going as it's gone on over the last year mm -hmm. and you know i'm I'm indebted to all of you um, that are on these uh, global star parties as, as well as others who have seen some of the work posted on social media mm -hmm. um, as you know, if you're saying that my that my astrophotography is getting better then I have no choice but to believe you so I will <laughs> uh, continue, you know, and the fact that I've invested in some explore scientific equipment tells you how much I value being a part of this star party. Oh, well, thank you very even much. Even though I'm, even thank though you. I'm still fatigued, I uh, looked forward to presenting for you all, and um, you know, just my work is a way to promote looking up at the night sky. Um, don't turn the blind eye towards light pollution, and go somewhere where it's dark because you may be surprised what you'll see with your own eyes. Right. And Adrian, I wanted to thank you as well. Again, I really did enjoy it tonight. Thank you, David. Of course, that little picture of uh, the Southern Cross out of a hotel window continues to be an inspiration for gathering all of the starlight that I can. Yeah, I've never forgotten that. It was actually taken from the parking lot. Parking, okay. So uh, but, I'll uh, change my presentation to be accurate. Parking lot. <laughs> Well, I think I use like hotel it. window. I seem to misremember, but that's okay. Just going out there and looking up with all the lights and then seeing the Southern Cross right on top was absolutely unforgettable. Hmm. And uh, I'm so glad that I, you were able to catch it when I was visiting last. It's great. Yep. It's good. absolutely. And you never know, and you never know what images will um, inspire. Unfortunately, I only have a memory of the crescent moon rising after that. And you could see the very thin crescent rising as well as the lineup of planets right before the sun crossed the uh, surface during um, civil dawn. And unfortunately, I didn't have my camera with me to capture that moment as well. It was beautiful. And I, I had to make sure I kept my eyes in the road long enough not to hit anybody because I was trying to observe it. But um, definitely, whether you view it or image it, it's it's about the night sky. It isn't about showing off a skill. It's about showing just how beautiful the night sky is. That remains my focus for my images. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, uh, you should uh, probably try to join up with a group called the World at Night, which is a group of astrophotographers that mostly do uh, sky photography, uh, landscape photography, um, 
and uh, just uh, you know the the your your work is uh, you know you have some really beautiful and sensitive work, Adrian. So um, thank you. You know, and so it's it's appreciated you share it with us. It's awesome. It's awesome. So Navin wanted to, he had an astrophoto that he wanted to share before we go to our 10 minute break. Do you want to do that, Navin? Sure. Um, this is going to be quick. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So I got a couple of photos recently. So this is basically a cardinal from my porch. Oh yeah. At my house. So uh, it was like a moving exposure couple of second exposure from like an iPhone 13 Pro Max. Cool. Good job on catching a cardinal in flight. I've struggled to do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, you kind of need a couple exposures, but the next one would be kind of better. This is the cardinal sitting on the branch before it flew on the on one of the bushes next to my porch. So then these are some nightscapes I kind of try to take, like the clouds moving and then like the like also from my porch, like at nighttime. Like you can see the uh, the house like next to us there, and then like some other houses there and some light pollution. Yeah. So now this is our neighborhood, like the sport, like the north facing view. You can see all that light pollution from all those street oh, lamps, yeah. all those clouds, even street lamps from the um opposite neighborhood. So it's a lot of light pollution. So then uh, your dad was <laughs> showing me the light pollution from his backyard last night. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot. So this is a bald eagle right here. That that's a bald yep. eagle. Wow. Right yep, good catch. We we went well, camping that last weekend, so we uh found it there. Uh I actually have a couple more bald eagle pictures. There's the bald eagles over there. And then we were actually in the middle of a hike when we took this, so we took a couple of second exposure on the phone. So it turned out pretty good. So about that, I'll and then say. so then we got a we got a sunset as it, um as the sun centered next to our campsite. So we have a, we got a couple exposures from that with the trees. This kind of was a darker site, so it was a bit away from the light pollution, but there still was a little bit of light pollution. So you could probably see a green light there. I don't know what that is, but you can see the lens flare. flare. Yep. Yeah, so prop that you can see the sun a little bit closer setting, and then that's the sun rising in the morning. Nice. Oh yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Great. All right, that's good. Okay, so we're going to take a little bit of a stretch here, uh, and uh, give everybody about a ten minute break. Uh, so it's a good time to get a something hot to drink or get a sandwich or something. And uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes and our speaker coming up next um, will be, will be, <laughs> keep everybody on pins and needles, Marcelo Souza uh, from Brazil. So um, we'll see you in a few minutes. Now we got to keep an eye out for Norm's name, Adrian. Let's see who gets up there first. Norm or Tariq or Chris. Harold. Who's the money on this time? Tariq, Tariq wins. wins. <laughs> <laughs> I think Tariq looks forward to it. I actually thought Beatrice might come in from the side and just beat them all, but yep. that'll be next time. <laughs> and Sintel, who's watching? Yep. Naveen, are you gonna? Are you thinking of giving one of the talks for uh, Cosmic Generation soon? Uh, probably. I might want to get one. That would be fantastic. Uh, I know uh, Nathan, Bella, Tara. Uh, they, they're all they're all looking for more people who are interested in chatting or sharing some of their ideas. Even the presentations that uh, UNCG are doing here, you can put those together into kind of a retrospective or something like that. Yeah, we could probably do one of those. Yeah. Or you could just go, you know, completely new topic and just 
go go crazy on it. That's always fun too. Yeah, we I have I have Nathan's email and um Taro in the Cosmic Generation email, so I can always get in touch. Awesome, awesome. Hopefully, Beatrice, that would be awesome. Well, thank you so much, Norm. It was a lot of fun, and uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Was, it was actually fun to learn about. Um, Adrian, it was good to see you again, and good to see your pictures. Yes, I will. I will look to return next week as i trying to make sure I don't have anything blocked away for uh, the month of April, and so far... Um, I don't. So the only thing on the calendar says the moon will be at Peregrine on the 19th. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can still do the star party with the moon <laughs> being at Peregrine. So Definitely. hopefully, hopefully no more surprise jobs come up on Tuesdays. Hey, don't I, don't knock them. Surprise jobs are good ones. They are good. And uh, also, I hope that Let's see. This is the month of April. So the month of May, I will be. Let's see. The full moon is the full moon is out and it's lunar, lunar eclipse. eclipse, May 15th lunar at night. Time. And yeah. I will be in Vegas. My, You're my gonna other miss it. hobby of bowling is encroaching on my more important um, pursuits of uh, astronomy. So I'll have to see what I can do. I'll be living vicariously through you, all the eclipse pictures everyone will take um, and share on that Tuesday. Well, I will be reaching out to Gianluca and uh, most likely sharing if we have clear skies, knock on wood, anything we get over here. Right now, I'm going to head out and see if there are any clear skies. And if there are, maybe I'll actually pull a telescope out for the first time in months. So it would be nice. It's been too yeah. long. Our forecast has gone back and the clouds are coming to us. So I think you have all we, sent them our way. No, no, we've got the rest of the week. We've got clouds and we've got ice. So uh, okay, it's, well, it's not going to be fun. Good night, everyone. Uh, stay tuned for session two. Uh, there's some great talks coming up. Um, yes. I think I'll be watching along uh, on one of the streaming platforms as I, uh, as I continue to try to recover from a, uh, long week of double duty <laughs> i didn't take the time off of my regular job so i would i do the regular job in the morning and then shoot through the evening for uh the film festival so it was rough but i made it through so excellent yeah excellent. i will talk to everybody later keep looking up everyone on the chat and everyone here definitely um, grab yourselves a coffee or tea and stay tuned for part two yep you got about five minutes
Webb's mirror segments began as beryllium ore mined in Utah. They crisscrossed the United States to be formed. Lightweight. Polished. Gold coated. And finally, perfectly placed on the backplane structure with the help of a robotic arm. You are muted, Scott. So I'm, we can't hear I am you. muted. <laughs> I did this so many times. <laughs> I just wanted to say hello, and I hope the, that everybody had a good break. And uh, you're watching the 88th Global Star Party with the theme of reflections. Um, up next is uh, Marcelo Souza uh, from Brazil. I was just watching him uh, uh, during some of the other presentations while he was uh, with the Lewis Cruz Astronomy Club. Uh, giving a live presentation as well. So you're a very busy guy, Marcello, and uh, it's it's great to have you on Global Star Party. Hi, how are you, Scott? Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank now, you. Now, I, 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 I invited you have two students of our project that uh, are here also participating okay. with us today because uh, today we launched our first app about astronomy. That's an, an app about the vari about variable stars. Yeah. Then I uh, have here the participation of Isabelle and Hi. Deborah. I, I will ask them to, to introduce themselves. Please, Isabelle. Hi, everyone. Good night. I'm Isabelle, and I'm from the programming part of the project. And that's all. <laughs> I'm part of programming. And... She is responsible to develop the apps. Yes. <laughs> it's, the program... uh, it's a part of programming of the project the Young Stars of Tomorrow. So I have two, uh, two students with me. So we, we are now. Uh, we are made this app, so it's mm. a presentation for you. Great. Hello, teacher. We have also Marcel. Deborah here. Deborah is responsible for the part of astronomy. Please, Deborah, could you introduce yourself? Hello, guys. My name is Deborah. I am a, stud a student here in Brazil. I do two degrees, one in science computer and the other in physics. Mm, in the project, I'm responsible for the astronomy part. With me, I have one student, Bruna, Bruna Pontes. She, she, she works with me in the project and the, in the development of, of this app, we have the help of a, um another another colleague in the project a volunteer a Kezia. so we are a team of three and we develop uh, a web that uh, people can use for measuring the variation of of stars the magnitude of the stars and send to us this data so we can analyze this data and produce um, producing information and the can knowledge. Great. The idea that uh, what motivated us to produce the, this app is because uh, we would like to find a way to motivate people to look with the make the eye to the stars and to the sky at night. 
then uh, we imagine that the if they have motivation to send data and work like uh, begin to work with astronomy and measuring the magnitude of the variable stars, this will motivate them to participate in other astronomy projects as they we only choose variable stars that are possible to see with the naked eye in the southern hemisphere. Wow. We used it as reference a uh, project that was developed by the AAV Visu. Is correct? Uh, the astronomy AAV itself? Yes. Yeah, that mm -hmm. they, they call it Southern Gems. And I made a translation for Portuguese many years ago. And okay. they use it as, as a reference for our app. Yeah. Now I, I will show here images, and the uh, Isabel can say mm -hmm. this is, is part of the Young Stars of Tomorrow project that we have the support and of the consulate of the United States in Rio de Janeiro. And these are the name of uh, the app in Portuguese that is uh, a variable bright something like this in English. I don't know the correct translation to English, but uh, uh, it's something that you really change the um, variable uh, bright of the stars. No? Then something we use it in Portuguese, only this for the name of the app. Mm -hmm. That we, we will produce also a version in English of the app, but this is the first version that is in Portuguese. Now, Isabel. Could you talk about the app? Yes. Uh, so is the professor uh, Marcelo says, and we made uh, uh, a variable stars app. So in the first in the first screen, we have uh, a notes. So. Um, uh, see on in the sky, see on the stars in the sky, and then take uh, pictures uh, to save the database. So uh, the name, star's name, uh, that is that is name uh, and a picture. So the second second screen we are terical, the parts tericals, and we. Uh, we, we are um, variable stars and and other other and the other in, in variable stars so uh, I I don't have a, a three a three screen a third screen yeah. uh, we have a, they make the registration the, send the all the information then mm -hmm. they have a database that yes. will record all the information about the observation of the star that we suggest. Mm -hmm. And with these information, we will produce light curves about I each see. star. And it shows the stars that it's possible to see with naked eye. And you have a short period. Now, Deborah, could you talk about this, please? Hello, are you hearing me? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So we we chose some stars and we based it on the material uh, developed by the American Association of uh, of Variable Stars. We 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 create we develop in this material in Portuguese. So this material we have a general information about variable stars as types and classification. And we have a guide and this guide teaches the, the persons how to, how to observe these stars on the sky. So we have star maps and the, using these star maps, the, the public can, can, can easily find the, these stars and compare 
the brighty for in the ending in this way uh, measure the magnitude, the difference between the magnitude. And the, we, we select some, some stars in South, South Hemisphere using this star that we select this list. We can use it, easily observe these stars uh, with naked eye. So we mm. don't, the people don't need the, uh, a telescope or a binocular, just the, using the eye. Uh, the, the app is divided in sections and each section help it to understand the other. And so we have general information, information about variables star, conceptual information and practical information. The idea is create a database uh, uh, sent using the data sent by the users. So this is the main idea of the, the app. It creates a database with the information sent by the users. He, here in Brazil is the first, first app uh, developing in such way for mm -hmm. such use. So it's very, very interesting. And we hope that people can, can join our idea. Absolutely. I, I have yeah. a question. Is is the the data going to the AAVSO or is it going to the students uh, in Brazil and they're creating the light curves? Yes, this is, is the main idea. We received, we have two students that work with Isabel and uh -huh. one student that work with Deborah, a student from Fundamental School in Brazil, elementary school. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will motivate the students in schools to participate in the project. And as we have a start with short periods, with the observation that they make, it will be possible to build the light curves. And we hope that they participate also when we analyze the information sent by them. Uh, Isabel? Uh, could you talk about the students that are participating with you? Yeah, it's a few students with me, uh, Kezia and Stephanie. So it's the different uh, cities in Brazil. So it's a, it's a very participating, it's a very clever, smart, and we... Uh, She's helping me uh, with this the app. So we study the 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 material. So I uh, study the, the code. So we three and we three of us uh, made a app in, together in in one. It's me, my part, and Stephanie uh, was the part of her, and Kezia part of her. So, mm -hmm. uh, in final, together, uh, this complete app, and the result is here, and it's a uh, it's a very very uh, beautiful and uh, beautiful work because it's uh, the first app. It's my first app and first app is mm. the two girls. <laughs> yeah, you so, guys must be very proud of that accomplishment. And uh, yes. you know, to do something that's so progressive and to be doing science at such a young age, it's really inspiring. It is yes. inspiring. Yes. Wonderful. I learned too much with this project, so she's learned too. <laughs> right? Yeah, and you're very lucky to have a great mentor like uh, Marcello Souza. He's, yes. uh, uh, I think he's a, uh, a great teacher and yet he's, uh, he's gentle uh, to help people learn more, you know, so, uh, and always inspired and and um, I think that everybody likes to uh, to work with Marcello if they can get the chance. 
Yes, absolutely. You were, you were great to look. It's a, it's a very opportunity. It's here, it's be here and to be in the project. It's a, all of it happened with this project. It's a very lucky and it's a grateful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great presentation. Thank, Thank you, Scott. you. And the, the important is that uh, what they develop, uh, they develop the system and all the tools that are necessary to produce apps. Then we are going to use in other apps uh, the <laughs> same system using the same tools. Then uh, soon we have another astronomy apps and also apps for the daily life here in Brazil. Then they are, we are planning to produce 10 apps until, the, until July. Uh, they already produced the apps, but uh, they are making the final adjustment. Then soon we are going to launch new apps. All right. It's good. It's all good. It's great. Uh, it, it seems that uh, you're always moving from uh, science project to science project, Marcello. So that's it's, uh, I'm sure it's very interesting for you, but uh, it is such a great opportunity for these young people that you're involved with. So, uh, you know, thank you for the hard work that you do. Thank you very much for yeah. your, all, all your support and help. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank and you. congratulations, Isabel and Deborah. Yes, yeah, great to that's right. Thank you very Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you for coming on to our thank program. You. Yeah, is this the first time for you to be on a, a live program for uh, in the U.S. or the world? Actually, it's a global. It's the second here. for me. It, uh, yes. I was in the, the the first presentation here. Yes, but. Uh, always a little bit nervous so i'm sorry oh, yeah <laughs> don't worry about that <laughs> it's life it's don't fine. worry about that that's it's fine it's fine you get you the, the main thing is you know what you're talking about so that that's the that's the big one you know so and you do so that's great and deborah thank you so much uh isabelle uh you guys have a great evening marcello thank you again it was wonderful and we look forward to seeing you on the next global star party so Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everybody. you so much. Bye bye. Thank you, teacher. My pleasure. Bye -bye. Thank you bye -bye. very much. Good evening, Scott. Thank you. Good evening. Okay. So up next, we're going to go to uh, Dan Higgins. And Dan, you got? Do uh, you have someone that uh, you're bringing on with you tonight? Do you hear us all right? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Hi, I, I actually thought I was on after two more after Marcello. I'm sorry, I apologize, but yeah. Uh, actually, Gary Palmer was supposed to be on, and uh, uh, he called in sick. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, my 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 guest is not here yet. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's see. Uh, let me see if Maxi or excuse me, T Matthias might be coming on. I tell you, why don't we why don't we take another short break, okay? And then we'll have um, you'll have your guest on, and uh, and then Matthias Schmidt should be on by that time. So okay, I apologize about that. I, I oh, no problem, to, uh, no problem. I, yeah, sometimes these things happen. So no, yeah, no problem. But uh, I did want to say I did want to say thank you for having me on um, on your uh, Astro World TV last. Or, Friday. I'm sorry that my audio system just was not behaving. So yeah, uh, I, you know, it, I, I I don't I don't know what the the problem was. Like it was my side or your side. I, I'm not 100 percent sure. I think uh, it was my side because I was trying to log in. These things happen sometimes where yeah. you know you're trying to do a live thing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, no, uh, definitely. You know, uh, and so definitely. I sign on my my piece my Mac for whatever reason didn't want to behave. So I sign on with my um, tablet, and that seemed to work for a while. And then there was this weird uh, static, and then 
echoes started happening and yeah you, you know I, I think it, it might have been the tablet but who knows i mean those things happen i think it was not. the tablet <laughs> yeah it, and no when the, those things happen when it comes down to uh you, you know technology you know it's just especially when you're doing it live you know so that's so true one of those that's things. true okay all right so we're going to take another 10 minute break here okay and um and we'll be back awesome
Hey, what's up, guys? How are you? Hey, Maxi. Hi. Hi, Matthias. Daniel. Hi, Max. 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 Maxi. Maximiliano. What is? What do you go by? Maximiliano, exactly from Argentina. Maximiliano. I just had uh, um, Noki tonight because on the 29th of the month in Argentina, people have Noki. I have friends in Buenos Aires. I was in Patagonia and in Antarctica for the solar eclipse. So I, oh. my heart, my, my <laughs> heart beats for Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm glad to hear it. So you you went to the solar eclipse in Antarctica? Yes, I did. No, oh, that's a, a a huge privilege to go there. You know, uh, I think you from here from Buenos Aires or Argentina went to Chile and then uh, go more to the south, right? It was in Ushuaia, and then we were on a vessel for two weeks. Hmm. Unfortunately, it was clouded on eclipse day, but. Um, we saw a million penguins to make up for it. <laughs> you know, for being in Ushuaia, there was a, a really good weather in that time because it was summer, practically. And you had, uh, well, in winter, it's like Alaska, for example. And in, in summer, it's cold, but uh, in that time, here in, in Buenos Aires province, it was really... Uh, too, uh, too much heat we had and i i could see the the solar eclipse by satellite images only and pictures that everyone's share but i it was a, a, a strange eclipse because it was pointing to uh, uh, well, passing by uh, in the southern atlantic and then goes by to uh, almost the, the the entire uh, across the world uh, if you see it uh, in the planisphere and the shadow was really really amazing i i could able to see the the 2020 eclipse sol solar eclipse that was uh, uh, in patagonia and that was really Pretty amazing, <laughs> a very good experience. And well, being in the south, uh, like you did, <laughs> is unbelievable. I was in San Juan province in 2019. I couldn't go in 2020 to join my friend uh -huh. in Argentina. So we went together. Uh, yeah, the 2nd of July. Yes, we, we have passing by here from Chivilcoy, from where I am. Uh, the center but yes we, we have clouds but then go when the sun goes down ah, see that huge ball black amazing hey guys <laughs> um we're we're back after our 10 minute break and uh we've got uh matthias schmidt here as well as dan higgins but it looks like dan does it look like your um uh your guest uh, is not going to make it. No, it looks like uh, looks like his spectrum is giving him an issue. Um, I see. And uh, I told him, I told him, go with FiOS, and uh, he didn't <laughs> listen to me. He and didn't uh, he's known on the show uh, at Astral when we were on the show. He's known as Max Headroom because he's always oh his internet's always <laughs> it's, it's slowing just, down. It's just, <laughs> oh it's horrible he tries to blame it on the kids and the streaming and it just it just never works okay yeah it's just horrible so so we'll just go on you know the show must okay. go on all right well, dan you're on man <laughs> yeah. so let's uh um you know uh when i was on last time uh with you at uh, astroworld it was it was great you you were uh uh covering a lot of um, aspects pretty much focused on my background and stuff like that. But uh, and then I, I watched for a little bit afterwards um, uh, as you guys transitioned out. How, how did the show end up? Oh, uh, the, the show ends up good. We, we get so many awesome questions from people all over mm -hmm. the all over the world. Pretty much we got and some of the people actually a lot of the people that are on this show 
yeah. uh, tra transition to us. So yeah, yeah, they follow the shows run. around. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. interesting because, you know, like people like Senthal watches every week. Uh, Jim's Astro watches every week. Mark Ellis. Yeah. I mean, I could go on with a bunch of people that go on and on. And I hate to say it, but, you know, you know, uh, Sugi and Navin, you know, they are they're just awesome. <laughs> yeah. They're, oh, yeah. They're, they're just Absolutely. awesome. And, and, and every time I'm on the show, they leave. They say, oh, I'm so excited to see the people from Astro. They leave before I come on. So I can't tell them how good they did. But but <laughs> nice job with the. Uh, with I the think PDP. they're watching out in the uh, in the chat room right now. So uh, amongst chat. So yeah, yeah. It, they, I think they said they were on YouTube. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're so. they're great, and they they tend to kind of play off of each other a little bit, and it's really yeah. cool to watch them give a presentation together. So it's, it's very cool. It's very cool. Yep, yep. Well, that's awesome. So yeah. what's up? What's next for um, Astro World TV? Well, next, I got the, let's see, I got the list right here. So next guest on Astroworld is going to be April 6th, and that's okay. going to be Bob Denny. And he is going to be giving oh, us yeah. a rundown um, of Alpaca. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's going to be a lot of fun because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people have been screaming for something that's not Windows-based for a long, long time. And uh, right. it's finally coming to fruition in, in one way or another. And Alpaca is going to be one part of that. So it's going to be really interesting on, on having him onto the show and give us a nice little uh, hour rundown on what it could do for those people that like uh, Macs or, um, or sure. uh, Linux boxes. Linux so, or, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, um, uh, I met Bob Denny many years ago uh, when I was working at Meet Instruments. And he flew his DC-3, you know, he's done the <laughs> DC-3. He flew it into, uh, I think, to John Wayne Airport, uh, which was very near the building at that time. And, uh, um, you know, he talks to me about this idea, about this uh, ASCOM idea, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about it. And, um, uh, you know, uh, Bob was talking about developing this community and, joining up all the software you know which would have given uh me to i think an incredible edge in the industry at the time and uh unfortunately the engineering <laughs> engineering team or the management at at meet instruments just did not see the value of it but uh bob denny went on to change the astronomical world with uh with by connecting net basically networking uh uh, planetarium programs and observatories and telescopes yeah. and cameras, all this stuff and uh, weather systems. And so it was just, um, you know, it was just really uh, remarkable. He came to the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference with me uh, and used an eight inch LX200 telescope. And he ran a script in front of me. It was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. And, and the scope was just robotically going from one minor planet to the next to the next to the next getting data and reducing data and all the rest of it and this is early 90s okay yeah so or mid 90s yeah. something like that i mean bob bob remembers the dates better than i do but uh um but he's a remarkable guy and he has given an incredible uh uh amount of resources to the astronomical community he's just very nice man, a real gentleman, you know. So yeah, I can't wait. I'm 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 super excited about that. Um, and then after that, uh, we have Charles Bracken uh, coming on on April 13th, um, who is the author of the Deep Sky Imaging Primer, amongst a bunch of other things. Okay. Uh, so he is going to be uh, on on the 13th, and then Eric Cole um, is going to be on May 13th, who's an astrophotographer and also part of. Uh, the Astro Imaging Channel. So uh, that's going to be awesome. And we also have Chris Woodhouse Thanks. coming on in, in a okay. recorded show. Um, that'll, yeah, that'll be a recorded show. That's to be announced. Um, and I just got some, I got some really cool news. Um, so for those of you though that don't know what Astroworld is, basically what we do is um, we do two shows a week and they're live YouTube shows uh, on Wednesdays and Friday nights um at uh, nine o'clock and eight o'clock eastern respectively and um we have guests and we have a whole bunch of stuff going on we talk all about 
just different topics on astrophotography, whether, and it's very, very a laid back, not comedic, but it's just very laid back atmosphere uh, that we kind of like to have. We make fun of each other and stuff oh, like yeah, that. Oh yeah, you so, guys are fun. Yeah, yeah so. you know, it, it doesn't have to be all serious because you know what? Yeah. We're astrophotographers. We make mistakes just like anybody else. Yes, our pictures are awesome and they look great and all this kind of stuff. And we spend hours and days and months and we're out of our minds and our wife wants to divorce us because we're spending $35,000 <laughs> worth of stuff you know so, that keeps you so, out of the bars at night uh, though right yeah you know I, that's what right. I, keep on I mean you could be us. spending thousands of dollars on booze right yeah i mean you, you know where you are you know I, I, I keep on saying get your kids involved in astrophotography because they won't have the money for yeah. drugs or alcohol so you know it's, you know they'll be fine you'll know where they are they're at the beach taking shots and whatever and that that's the right case. yeah but, getting into trouble while you're at home in your backyard making images exactly I mean, exactly so but, but yeah, it's, it's all good. And, and that's what we do. We, we do a lot of stuff on that. But we also have a lot of giveaways and stuff like that. And one of the, the biggest giveaway that we have so far, and we're giving it away this summer. And you have, you have to be a YouTube subscriber to get this in order to, in order okay. to get, be involved in this. We have a one of a kind Prima Luce Eagle 4 Pro. Ooh. Okay. Okay. It's going to be totally max. Well, not totally max, almost totally max. 32 gig of RAM, Wi Fi 6, um, brand new two terabyte Samsung Evo 980 Pro hard drive. Um, oh. It's going to be tall. And, and the best thing about this, forget about all that stuff. The coolest thing about this, it's going to be matte black. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be matte black. And, and it's going to be done in a way so that the letters and the writing on it are red. So, okay. so it's going to be a little reverse. Oh, so it's only going to be look. two. All right. There's only going to be two in the United States. In the whole world. In the world. Okay. So one is going to be given away through Astroworld. And I think we're going to do it on the, the 4th of July week, somewhere in there. I think we're sure. going to do it in the, right in the middle. And the other one, <laughs> Tom's keeping. So Tom Bramwell over at Prima Lucha Lab, uh, who runs USA, is going to be keeping it for himself. So, <laughs> so. So that I'm super excited about. And it's a giveaway. It's not a raffle. It's a complete giveaway. But you do have to be a, a YouTube subscriber, and we will cross-reference everybody. Okay. So, Dan, sure why don't you that. put uh, your YouTube channel in chat for me, and I'll just post it on the uh, in the yeah. chat for the audience. Yeah, if, you, if you just go to Astro World TV on YouTube, we're the first You'll one. You'll find it. Okay. Yeah. What the first one there. Just don't go to Astro World. I have too many people coming up to me and saying, I came here for Travis Scott. And, you know, for those of you that don't know who Travis Scott is, Travis Scott is an American rapper um, who just recently almost got arrested for something because of his concert. Some people got beat up at his concert or something. Uh oh, yeah, it was, it was not a good thing. But um, whatever the case may be, you know, go check out Astral. And you know what I did tonight? I got first light on something. Hmm. Um, and don't make fun of the picture because it's really, you know, this is literally <laughs> So this is on a very a semi low budget stuff. It's on an EQM 35 with a red okay. cat, um, All right. an ASI air and an EAF and that's it. And people that know me are going to make fun of me because I am the CCD mono guy. Uh, and I don't do, I don't do CMOS color. I just don't. You just don't. I, I just don't do it. I, you know, I, my <laughs> first real camera was in uh was the sac 7b but okay. way back when that was mono and then i bought my s big stf 8300 mono which you know workhorse camera sure awesome and then i got a qhy 16200 so then that's another it's easy to do. and, and oh. so why why is it that you're so enamored with these mono cameras well the, the resolution on it is just is just outstanding on it but yeah. you know what i gotta okay. tell you that that cmos is catching up very very close uh to what you could get i mean they're right. very you know you'd be hard pressed to find some of the differences between these mono shots and these these high-end color cmos cameras i mean yeah. like the like you know, 2600 or 6200 um that that are just ridiculous but but <laughs> Here's the picture, and you, you're gonna have to excuse it. Believe it or not, this is a new camera. You're gonna have to excuse the big dust mode, but um, this is completely raw. So yeah. I mean, if 
but I wanted to see if I could do. Okay. Okay. You see that? Yep. So yes. that is a it's five, focused. It's focused. I can see galaxies. You can see galaxies, and that's a five-minute shot at Portal Eight Plus. Wow. <laughs> so. Wow. So, I mean, it, should I be going five minutes in my area? No, absolutely not. Um, that is just not good. So I lowered it down to two minutes. Um, okay. And it's slowly loading up. And that's a little bit better. Okay. It looks a little smoother. A lot yeah. smoother, a lot less gradient. I, could pro I should probably even go down to a minute and just do a whole bunch. But mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, when this is all put together, this is going to look pretty good. But this with a red cat, I got a bunch of bunch of little galaxies. Little here. galaxies, yeah. Yeah, you know, and uh, you know, in in all fairness, you know, just so just so uh, you know, I, I like to show this. Let's see if I can go into um, where's my C? I got too many hard drives. I'm sorry. <laughs> the completed images, and this is. This is one of mine here. And okay. Oh, that's <laughs> this is what you really do. This is what I really do. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is uh with an uh, uh, esprit wow. 80. Um That's beautiful. Thank you. Um that that's the the esprit 80 with the uh, S, the S Big camera. Mm -hmm. Um and uh that's with the um believe it or not that's with the uh the uh, Optolongs, the seven uh, H okay. Alpha and the six and a halfs. Um, but yeah, so that, really that's gorgeous. That's Beautiful. what I do. Yeah, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of stuck with narrowband being from Long Island. I can't really I could do RGB, but it's a lot more difficult <laughs> yeah. than than narrowband, obviously, with being the light pollution the way it hey, is. I love the narrowband shots. You know, I think they're great. So. Yeah, you know, it's it's all about seeing the structure and the nebula and stuff. And I mean, really oh. remarkable. I mean, I can remember in uh, uh, Jarvink says <laughs> a lot. I remember in the this 1980s just oh, crying over light pollution, you know, so um, so it people was... are making fun of my picture behind me. I'm sorry. So oh. <laughs> Max is making fun. Well, well, because. All right. So there's a story about this picture behind me and I'll try and okay. get to do with it before, before it switches on me because it switches on me. But, um, a, a gentleman on YouTube or Facebook or something said, Oh my God, you know, that horse head nebula is great. It looks like Jar Jar Binks from star Wars. <laughs> so I said, Oh, okay. So I just had to do it. So, so well, I just, did, I just did, uh, I just did that to my horse head nebula and now I well, got Jar Jar Binks in the horse head. <laughs> I have another comparison that I did the, the picture uh, this weekend. Uh, you know, if you hear about the the Mistr uh, Gabriela Mistral Nebula, yeah, it's, it's near in the Kalina Nebula, and uh, that nebula is called by a, a poetry uh, from Chile because uh, it has the shape like his face. But I am a Star Wars fan. And I compared uh, like the the Senator Palpatine ah, nice. in episode three, yep. when he says, uh, not from a Jedi, and he turns around and you can see the, the same face. And, <laughs> and now I start to call it also the Palpatine Nebula. <laughs> nice, nice. There you go. Hey, you know, we got a Star Wars Nebula finally. So that yeah. finally, yeah, <laughs> had to happen. And we uh, have to yeah. do a, a new catalog for the yeah. fans, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> That's funny. That's good. Yeah, but but again, like like this kind of back and forth that we're having now, that's exactly what we do on the show. So it's yeah. just a lot, a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of having fun and and it's a lot of learning on both sides. So absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's great. Well, I'm sorry that uh, Scott was unable to join us no. tonight, but uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about him other than he's got bad internet? <laughs> oh, he's got, he's got horrible internet. Um, as, as a matter of fact, I, I got, let's see, do I, do I have it here? I think I do. I, hold on a second. I, I okay. had to, so, so somebody had to, Scott doesn't say a lot. And when Scott says something, yeah. he kind of throws his face into the camera. And he kind of he kind of leans in like this, and so and, he's like bursting your bubble through uh, the monitor. 
Yeah. Kind of, so, so one of the guys on on the channel were just making fun of him left and right. So, yeah. So <laughs> he took a picture of Scott and threw it on the Discord, and <laughs> and this is what it looked like. <laughs> 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 and this is just scott being his normal self here? this is scott being scott that's it oh, okay you know? all right I, I do remember him <laughs> oh yeah i'm sure you do but i mean you know he's a great guy and uh yeah he, you know he is a professional um uh, portrait photographer and ah. uh like you know livestock birds sure um, you know different landscapes and that kind of stuff um but he does a lot of work like that and his his wife Sho Finn is a um, a web designer, so um, both of so them have creative been creative family. Yeah. yeah, and and they've both been instrumental in making the logo. Uh, they both made the logo. Um, Very cool. They've been doing some help on the website and that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. we make fun of Scott a lot. I remember, we would talk about spending thirty thirty five thousand on yeah equipment. Well, that's what he did for his that's first. That's what telescope. Scott did. First telescope. <laughs> Oh. First telescope buys a C14 edge. Yeah. A a a a, a, a um, Lasmandi 11 HD, you know, mount. Yeah. With a rainbow mount head on it. Um so he's got, you know, it, it's it's ridiculous with with the Eagle 4 Pro and the whole thing, the whole shebang on him with JMI wheelie bars and everything. Jeez. And yeah. The uh, monster Moag off-axis guider, mm. um, and uh, what else? You know, he's got the, um, the 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 automated focuser by Feather Touch, and mm. it's it's a, it's a whole bunch of big mess. And you know what? Out of all of this, he's had all this stuff. He's been putting it together since he's been on the show for like, I guess about over 13, 14 months now. Okay, yet to take a picture. Really, has not taken a picture that yet. That seems to be like a crime. There should be like uh, some sort of astronomer police, you know, force out there that goes out there and at least gives him a ticket, you know. Oh, so. yeah. I, I'm going ready to drive down to Florida and drag that wheelie bar back to New York. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll sit there and do that. I'll do the 1,700 miles all the way up. <laughs> all the way up. That's right. But, I mean, you know, but yeah, Scott's getting a, he did, in all fairness to Scott, he just moved from, from uh, Rochester, New York. Uh, to Northern Florida. So, so mm -hmm. in all fairness to him, he actually got it down to Florida safe and sound because we all know how shipping has been working recently with damaging equipment and all that. Yeah. But, um, you know, he got it down safely and everything's up. He's finally got it up and running. So hopefully, Good. hopefully this summer we'll see some pictures from him in, uh, in the nice steady skies of Florida. So, yeah. Oh yeah. And they are steady. Yeah. So that's, uh, one of the real attractions of doing astronomy from down there, you know, just incredible seeing conditions. Yeah, I know. So, I know nothing about that. No, no, I, I'm not in Long Island. I know nothing about. You've never been skies. down there. <laughs> no, I've been down there, but not to image. You know, I've been oh, there, oh. you know, you know, um, you know, I had to go down and see. Okay, that next winter thing. star party, you come down to the to. Absolutely. Okay, I'm, so, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready right. for that, and I'm ready yeah. for Okie Tex, and I'm ready yeah. for. Uh, um, I, I, you know, I know it's not as good as anywhere else, but I've been dying just to go to Staunton River and, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's, but Cherry Springs is coming up in three months, right? Yeah. And that's a really dark site. Yeah. I, I, I go there a lot. Religiously. So I, yeah, okay. Yeah, I go there cool. a lot, but anyway, I don't want to, you know, I know it's 10 o'clock, so, uh, um, I could be like, okay. Scott, be like, it's 10 o'clock. It's time to it's 10 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> so you did Scott's bit. Thank you. <laughs> no, if I did Scott's bit, this might this might turn, you know, <laughs> NC 17. So <laughs> okay. well, Daniel, thanks for coming on again to the Global Star Party. So absolutely um, party. Yeah. You know. And um uh you know, hit me up sometime. We'll do a door prize for Astro World TV that you absolutely. can give away. Okay. Yeah, you got it. All right. Sounds Thanks, good. Scott. Have a good night, Max. Matthias, good luck. Thank Take you. All right. All right. Have a good night. Here we go. Okay. So uh, the, our next speaker is Matthias Schmidt. And Matthias and I have known each other. I think we're going maybe on seven or 10 years, something like that at this point. Um, when I meet Matthias, uh, he 
uh, is uh, the executive producer for a children's uh, science-based uh, television program called Space Racers. And, um, you know, I was really fascinated uh, by the concept and uh, watched a number of the episodes. My grandchildren were watching it, so they were, they were turned on by it. And I encouraged Matthias to go to the Northeast Astronomy Forum. And I don't know that he had been to a, a big astronomy event like that, but I knew that he was very interested in astronomy. And so uh, uh, we collaborated on a few things, but um, it wasn't too much longer that Matthias uh, uh, confided in me that he wanted to uh, make a change in his life and, uh, and to really you know, chase his dreams. And um, so he did that. And uh, you don't really see that very often in people because one, I mean, it really takes a, it takes a brave individual to fundamentally change what they're doing and make a break and go and do what exactly what they want to do. And so, um, you know, I'm really, you know, I'm proud to call Matthias a friend. He is, uh, um, he is still following his dream and that has culminated in a program called uh, Stargazing Zion at the Zion National Park. And so I'm going to bring uh, Matthias on. He is, Matthias is also an uh, Explorer Alliance ambassador. And um, he is, uh, he's running an amazing program right now. So tell us more about it. Hi, guys. Thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah, we met uh, maybe eight years ago at uh, eight years. Yeah, like that Northeast Astronomy um, Forum, and I knew nothing about astronomy. And uh, Scott has been very generous with his time, very helpful. And in 2017, I was in Oregon for the total solar eclipse, and I was infected with an incurable virus called Eclipsophile. And uh, um, ever since then, I've been traveling to see eclipses. I was in uh, Argentina 2019, 2020. I wasn't able to travel, unfortunately. Um, last December, I was in Antarctica on a vessel um, and saw the longest, cloudiest total solar eclipse ever and uh, was compensated with seeing a million penguins, luckily, wow. and icebergs and seals. Okay. And uh, for any of you guys that are watching and are wondering uh, what to do you know, with your lives, maybe, um, today is what matters. Yeah. There's always a first step. When I got back from Oregon, I um, became active in the astronomy club in New York City, where I'm still a member. I enrolled in the Master of Astronomy program at Swinburne, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm finishing this year. And uh, then 2020, um, I um, wanted to move out west because I love astronomy, I love teaching, and I wanted to be active uh, in a in a school, I was teaching at a high school in New York, and uh, uh, I found uh, an opportunity in Cedar Breaks National Monument, which mm -hmm. is a national park in southern Utah, um, and I'm the dark sky coordinator there. I wish I could coordinate dark skies or clear skies, <laughs> yes. but I don't have that power. Um, but I love what I do, and uh, last year I met somebody through the St. George Astronomy Group, where I was voluntarily pressured to be the vice president now. Oh, wow. Uh, and I've met wonderful people in astronomy that are very encouraging with their time, with their knowledge. And um, um, I started a private stargazing business called Stargazing Zion, which is adjacent to Zion National Park, which received its uh, dark sky uh, accreditation um, last year. So the skies are really dark. Um, and um, I do tours there um with a few people um and i'm just going to give you an idea of um, uh, how it looks there i use a uh, stellarium to plan tours and um um i've done a stellarium uh class for the uh, astronomy club in uh, in new york city so uh, if we were in the field tonight uh, this is how it looks the sun would be setting here in the west um, here is, is, this is the border to Zion National Park. Um, and um, here you look uh, to some of the um, 
um, peaks of Zion National Park. Um, and here is our field. And the, this this picture was taken in, uh, as you can see from the from the wheat here. This was taken last last year in August. So I uploaded a 360 panorama into Stellarium, um, and this helps to uh, you know initially to plan tours and figure out when certain objects um, are rising and where they are in the sky. And um, you know if we would go like you know a little bit forward. Um, you know, you'd see the Milky Way here. Yeah. This direction. Um, this is like, I would say like a Bortle tool, um, a Bortle tool location. You have some light pollution from San George, uh, which is close and uh, uh, Cedar City in this direction. On um, Sunday night, we did a tour and we had the ISS pass a low to the horizon for a few minutes. We saw plenty of uh, satellites um, we, um, um, we saw some, um, meteors and, uh, it, it was, it was a pretty, uh, pretty clear night. Um, I'll just show you some pictures for you to get an idea how, uh, what we do for, for the people that, um, um, let's see that, uh, that visit us. Um, where is my, uh, uh so, okay. Let's see. Where is my Zoom? Share my screen. Thank you for being patient. No, no problem. So uh, we have a uh, um, photographer that uh, uh, takes pictures of our of our guests. There's a little lamp. This is this is not fire. <laughs> this right. is a light bulb. And uh, you know, here you see Zion National Park. Here's some light pollution from Cedar City, um, and uh, uh, people. Just love the experience to sit on uh, under dark skies. We have these yogi boat chairs, which are like uh, uh, bean bags, and uh, you know we have telescopes. People are lying down here and look. It's like this is like a natural planetarium. Yeah, and um, you know here you can see Orion. Uh, here you can see the Pleiades. Um, here, uh, here is me being in action with a laser pointer. Um, we have a bunch of telescopes. I'll give you just an overview in a moment of, uh, you know, here's another picture. We have these, you know, red lights, although it, people don't trip over the tripods. Here, here are our visitors, mm -hmm. you know, they just uh, lay down and I, you know, tell people if it's very comfortable and you fall asleep, you know, feel free to do so. Just uh, um, if it becomes really interesting, you know, um, I'll, I'll wake you up or maybe your own snoring wakes you up. Um, but, uh, um, you know, <laughs> so, uh, Matthias, uh, are these people, they're coming to you, uh, are they experienced amateur astronomers, some of them, or are they new to experiencing the dark sky? So most of them are coming to Zion National Park as okay. uh, tourists to visit. Um, I get a lot of questions about what telescope sh they should buy. Um, mm -hmm. We've gotten some amateur astronomers, but these are mostly people that just have never seen, you know, the Milky Way, or oh, wow. have never gone on a uh, on a, a stargazing tour. And you know, because of the increasing um, uh, light pollution that we have to deal with, I'm also a member of the International Dark Sky Association. Um, we're you know slowly losing the night sky to urban development and poor poor lighting. You know, we could fix a lot of the problems that we have with uh, light pollution, especially on the horizon, with just using proper lighting. Yeah, just hanging it down. Yeah, and um, um, it's it it fills you know it fills me with joy for people to come and just are totally blown away by the night sky. You know, I, I don't always want to say it's easy to have a tour when the night sky is this pristine. But um, we we love what we do, and we believe that if we share what we love, it gets multiplied. So we want to give these people just some basic tools to navigate the night sky, what to look for, when, and um, uh, and for them become, um, you know, uh, night sky advocates on their own. So when they, uh, when they get home and they say, you know what, I could improve my outdoor lighting. Sure. Or I could, um, 
uh, in, you know, I could invite neighbors and we'll just do our own little star party. You know, you don't, you can do naked right. eye star parties with binoculars. You see a wonder of, uh, of objects and, um, you know, with telescopes, it gets even better. And uh, we do we do take pictures with uh, um, uh, some of our uh, telescopes and uh, and you know we we share them with our uh, with our visitors afterwards and um, um, you know something like this you know they like when they when they look through a telescope you know this is this is an um, a unistellar EV scope, you know, when they see something like this, you know, they're just blown away. They're, they're saying, you know, this, this, you can, you can see this in the night sky with a telescope. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is amazing, right? This is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, this is not a Hubble telescope image, but you know, they see and they get an appreciation of how wonderful our universe is. And, um, um, the tours are about, uh, uh two hours, um, we start at the gate of the, of the land, uh, where we hold our star parties. And mm -hmm. I have a little uh, scale system of the solar system set up and, uh, we walk from the gate to the observing site where the, where the chairs are. And, uh, I go through all the planets. Of course, it starts with Pluto. There's always controversy, you know, that's, that's, it's fun to talk about what sure. people think, you know, what they know. And, um, We'll go through Pluto, the outer planets, the terrestrial planets, and then I ask the the guests. So, if these distances are scientifically accurate, how big do you think the sun is? And um, you know, the sun for those distances to be accurate is yeah. the size of an orange. And uh, uh, you know, who gets closest to the answer it gets a little meteorite from uh, uh, from an meteor that fell down, uh, sorry, meteorite that fell down in, in Argentina. It's um, uh, 4.6 billion years old. It's one of the mm. building blocks of our solar system. And then I ask, That's so, cool. okay, the sun is the size of, a, of an orange. Where is the closest star? And uh, the closest star, Proxima Centauri, is where Chicago would be. So that gives people an appreciation of yeah. the scale of just our solar system and our uh, uh, immediate neighborhood. And then I do a, um, a little uh, cosmic calendar uh, tour and uh, where I compress uh, the age of the universe into a calendar year, um, uh, thanks to Carl Sagan, who popularized this, this idea. And we start at the, um, January 1st, midnight, the Big Bang, and, and uh, December 31st, midnight, uh, New Year. And there are some uh, benchmark dates uh, that we talk about. So that way people have a sense of the time scale of the universe. So first mm -hmm. we do the distance scale, then we do the time scale and, you know, to slowly uh, uh, lead uh, our guests into uh, an appreciation of uh, how, how insignificant we are, but also how significant, you know, we are yes. here as a result of, um, 13.8 billion years of evolution in our universe. And uh, it gives people a, a moment to pause and just enjoy this vastness of uh, the universe, this, uh, this infinite ocean. And, uh, and then we do a, a telescope tour. We look at uh, um, the nebula. Uh, we look at the open clusters. We look at globular clusters. And, uh, and galaxies, you know, depending on what time of the year it is, we see different types of objects, but, you know, with every, with every category, you usually find at least one or two uh, to give people a sense of what's out there. And then uh, we finish with a constellation tour. Mm -hmm. And um, um, this is always fun to talk about the constellations of the Zodiac. And I say, you know, everybody should know at least uh, one constellation of the Zodiac, you know, and then I say, I'm an Aquarius. So Aquarius, right. okay. you know, Leo, Gemini, and then people are like, oh, this is cool. And, um, uh, it, and then people have, lot, uh, people have wonderful questions, you know, and, uh, you know, where's the closest black hole? And I tell them, well, the closest black hole is in my uh, laundry room between my washer and my dryer. <laughs> yeah. All the black socks keep disappearing. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, I love what I do and we love what we do at Stargazing Zion. And yeah. um, it, it's, uh, 
for to see how excited people are and uh, how curious they are you know the, the, we have the curiosity of children in us mm -hmm. and um uh, uh frank herbert said uh he wrote uh, dune the desert planet that the universe is always one step beyond logic so it's really a nice kind of balance mm. to have so many questions about the universe that you know you we haven't really answered yet and then understand so much about the universe and uh, how we arrived at answers to some of the most basic questions. And um, it's never too late to learn something new. My, my uncle in Germany, he's 95. He started to become a hobby astronomer 20 years ago. Okay. And these days, you know, once a week, I get a cool picture from him. The other six days, he complains about the clouds. So, you know, if you're a hobby astronomer, that's uh, that's kind of normal. Part. It's normal. You know, it's normal. It's yeah. never too late. You know, today, yeah. what matters, it always starts with the first step, no matter how small it is. And, um, you know, this is, uh, I'm here because of uh, people like you, Scott, and wonderful members of the astronomy clubs that I'm a member of. And, of course, you know, if there wouldn't be a demand by uh, or interest by people in the night sky, I wouldn't yeah. have a job at the, uh, uh, for the National Park Service or a, a stargazing business. So uh, it's right. wonderful to see that people continue to be interested in this and are and the interest uh, uh, is growing. So, Matthias, you I mean you've gone through this big transformative experience. Okay, uh, by most people's standards, you were living a extremely successful life. You were living in New York. You're an executive producer of a successful program. Uh, you would think that, um, that, you know, I mean, to make such a big change is, uh, and I said you were brave, and that's true. Um, uh, but uh, this transformation, I mean, personally, how, I mean, do you think that it's really changed you for the better? Do you think that uh, would you have changed anything about this? I, uh, I think life goes in circles. Okay. When I was a teenager, I was in engineering school in, in Germany and uh, uh, I studied physics at university, but I was lacking social maturity. So I didn't have the, the grit to, uh, uh, to go through with a, a challenging program. And uh, I left and I uh, went into business school. I came to America. I was in finance after another panic attack. I um, decided this is not for me. I uh, started helping out with the uh, kids TV show, which mm -hmm. was a, 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 a total new stimulus for me to explore uh, talents that were and talents and interests that were lying dormant. Mm -hmm. And um uh it, it it kind of you know the, the the pilot light never never got extinguished the pilot light I, for I science and astronomy you sure. know was always was always there it just it just took a while and some social maturity to uh uh uh, uh to really light the fire and yeah. to energize me and all it took was uh, a total solar eclipse which is kind of ironic because you know you don't see the sun but all of a sudden you're being uh, i was energized by something that wasn't there right um uh, that you didn't see um and uh yeah courageous brave sometimes you know for me i uh it was uh, 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 spring 2020 and uh, uh, COVID was raging in Manhattan. And, um, you know, I was, I sat down and meditated and I was asking myself one of the most basic questions. Mm. What do you want to do with your life? Yeah. And the answer was, I love astronomy. I love teaching. I want to be under, uh, I want to be out West in nature. Um, on, in New York, I saw maybe 15 stars, a lot more stars on Broadway or wannabe stars. <laughs> right. And then I just decided, okay, um, uh, I, I'm going to regret this if I'm not going to try. Yes. And uh, so my friend Guillermo from Buenos Aires, who is my eclipse spouse, 
who I met at the solar eclipse in uh, Argentina in 2019. He's a graphic designer. So I asked him, can you help design my, my resume? Okay. He said, yes. So he sent me this, this design draft of uh, my resume and I saw it and I started crying and I thought, if I can't get a job with this resume, because it was really creative, I'm yeah. never going to get a job. So <laughs> I applied out my first job at a charter school in Arizona as a science teacher. And okay. uh, on Monday, I sent in my resume. On Tuesday, they called me back. Wednesday, I had a Zoom interview. Thursday, they offered me the job as science teacher. And I thought, Wonderful. Wow. <laughs> But it was biology for, you know, in high school for teenagers. And I wanted to focus on physics and astronomy. And uh, so I said, no, thank you. And I kept looking. And then um, there was this job at the uh, uh, Cedar Breaks National Monument. I applied and my boss said, Matthias, you are that crazy to move from New York City to Cedar City. That's worth a shot. Hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, I think... Um, uh, you might some uh, some of the viewers might have heard of the book The Alchemist. Yes. Um, um, uh, if you really want something, the universe conspires to help you. I think I'm par paraphrasing here, mm -hmm. and the universe just uh, guided me on this path. You know it, that sounds a little bit esoteric and philosophical, but. Um, if there's something that you love doing, you know, whether it's art or, you know, astronomy or science, you know, pick, pick your favorite hobby there. You will find a way to make it work and you will never work another day in your life. I, right. you know, I love, I love what I do. And uh, if I, you know, in, in the winter when there's not much, not, not that many tours, you know, luckily I, um, you know, I have dark skies. So I took uh, an image of the Andromeda Nebula with my ED80. Right. And uh, it's wonderful. You know, is it a big change? Do I, I miss my friends in New York? I miss, sure. you know, I miss sushi, I miss soccer. Um, but uh, if there will be new things to fill your life with. And, sure. uh, you know, the fear can be a powerful motivator. Hmm. And uh, as long as you recognize what that beyond behind the fear is also excitement, fear and excitement are cousins. Yeah. Uh, or, or, you know, fear and courage are, you know, cousins that are under uh, 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 um, supported by excitement. So there are, and to, within today's age, with the internet, with education at the tip of your fingers, um, and if you are open-minded, if you ask people for help, this is like Hogwarts, right? You know, if you ask for help, help will appear. Yeah. Um, it's um, uh, this. The night sky is a, a a global commons that we need that we need to try to uh, um, uh, preserve uh, uh, for us as a species and. With all, I see amazing pictures on Instagram um, by people that all of a sudden have gone, become more active in the hobby of astrophotography, and it is it is amazing how creative and how much energy people have in pursuing their hobbies. And hobby a hobby can become a profession, and you can make a living. Yes, that's right. It becomes a lifestyle. 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 Yes. Yeah. A lot of people will ask me, you know, uh, yeah, so your hobby is your job. And I go, well, you know, for me, it's, I, I think it's more of a lifestyle, you know, and uh, the, the transformation that you're talking about, I've seen, uh, you know, happen to many people to different levels, you know, I mean, for, in your case, I, I felt it was very dramatic and uh, amazing. And uh, it really made me happy to see you go and do this because I knew that um, I knew that you had become, uh, you'd gone over the tipping point, you know, especially uh, after expressing your excitement over the eclipse uh, that you saw, you know, I mean, Matthias and I call each other on a semi-regular basis and and uh, share share our ideas and and I you know uh, thoughts on things and um, you know I think that 
probably your program, this, uh, you know, Stargazing Zion. I think that what's happening is that you are creating kind of a transformative environment using the night sky. Uh, you know how powerful it is, okay, to, to you know, kind of uh, shed, you know, you do some... I, I, you know, I've heard it termed ego loosening, okay, uh, but when you get people out under the night sky and you keep them up long enough, okay, and they're out there observing and they, and then someone says, hey, can I ask you a stupid question? I know right then, okay, when, when they ask me that, okay, and if it's about astronomy, I know that at that point that they, they're going through, uh, uh, they're waking up. Okay, and they are um, really starting to learn and explore. And this can happen at any age. I mean, they could be 100 years old or they could be 15 or 10. Okay, but this this kind of experience can happen. And um, uh, at that point, uh, for many, that is that is the that tipping point sends them off on a journey that never stops. You know, so um, and so that's that's kind of uh, when you join the if there's a fraternity of astronomers, that's that's kind of the induction right there. So, right. So that's that's wonderful. And I'm glad to see that you have uh, created this program. And, um, you know, if there's anything I can do to support or promote uh, your your uh, uh, stargazing Zion, I'm happy to do that. Why don't you talk a little bit about the people that you recruited, you know, and, and what were you looking at in, in, in your group, uh, you know, to, you know, are they, would you, did you handpick these people or, or was it, uh, did they find you? So the people that I, uh, um, oops, that was unintended. <laughs> I, there we go. The, these fancy lights you know that you can control sometimes they just go to sleep on their own no. yes um uh, so last year i met these uh, uh, two wonderful people hannah and adam that uh, do a tubing business in zion where you basically go down the virgin river that carved zion national park over millions mm -hmm. of years and uh, um they were saying you know uh, our uh, clients come and ask what can you do at night and um, Zion has wonderful dark skies, so uh, they were looking for somebody that is interested in astronomy outreach, and, you know, the universe guided me to them, they found me, I found them, mm -hmm. and, um, and now this year, in our second year, uh, there's, uh, um, the, the demand is exceeding our expectations, and we're looking to hire astronomy guides. So we're trying to uh, recruit them from, um, you know, local universities, colleges, and kind of everywhere. And we're looking for uh, people that have, uh, you know, physics or astronomy background. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because we, uh, we want to be able to talk about the science and not just have somebody, you know, talk about the constellations, um, and tell stories, you know, which is essentially as well, uh, because storytelling has helped us to uh, um, uh, grow uh, as, a, as a species. We're essentially social animals, and the night sky has been an important navigational tool and a calendar. And, um, you know, I, I kid that when you look at some of these constellations and their names, that uh, when the Greeks came up with, with these names, they probably had a lot of wine to drink that night. Um, or, so, right. so, or, or, so or something. Or something. Wine yeah. or whatever they were drinking back then. Yes. So, you know, when, uh, when we look at some of these objects, I think it's really, um, it's good to have um somebody explain in basic terms the science behind something you know the difference between a planetary nebula and uh, an emission nebula and a supernova remnant you know they're all called nebula and uh, when we talk about the solar system you know why the gas giants are so big and why the terrestrial planets are so small or people always ask about black holes you know how black holes form 
and uh, it's um, you know when you are when you have a science degree of physics or astronomy or or geology degree and have studied some planetary science it is really a, a, a distinction and a competitive advantage to have somebody explain in most basic terms, you know, the science or how a telescope works. Yes. And, you know, people ask about the Hubble Space Telescope. People ask about the James Webb Space Telescope. And, right. um, um, you know, we want our audience to not just hear some, you know, cool and funny stories but also at least have the opportunity to be exposed to the science behind sure. astronomy. You know, astronomy is arguably the oldest science. And um, um, it, we have such a huge body of knowledge in astronomy that borrows from a lot of other um other areas people always ask about aliens you know is there other life out there and if you are a biologist or if you have taken a few astrobiology courses then you can you know not just say you know i i tr if, i'm german it's hard yeah. to believe but you know even germans can have a sense of humor so people ask about <laughs> People ask about aliens and I say, you know, there's a big sign outside by Pluto and uh, that says, you know, don't visit the third rock from the sun, at least not oh, yet. That's it. <laughs> yes. So, you know, you can talk about, I say, if you ask 50 astrobiologists about the definition of life, you get hundred different answers. But then we just have discovered the fifth uh, thousand exoplanet, right? So we didn't know exoplanets. Yeah, when we were kids, with the, uh, we, that was just... They didn't know fiction. that there were planets out there. It was science fiction. Exactly. Right. So uh, it, I think it's, you know, in times where, or not just these times, but any times where science can be abused, mm -hmm. a lot of people claim to be scientists. What I have discovered for myself is that astronomy has been the most humblest of educations with every kind of glimpse of an answer that I have about a topic, I have a hundred more questions. Mm -hmm. And I am amazed by the speakers that you invite, by the knowledge of the guests that you have, of the audience. Mm -hmm. um, it is fascinating. I learn more from other people uh, just by listening and uh, wondering uh, than anything else. And I realize how little in fact I know about all these things, but yeah. I love what I do. And if I get to share just a little bit of knowledge that I've uh, uh, acquired and have been exposed to, maybe, you know, this continues for people to have a different attitude towards science. You know, people say, oh, I have a theory. You know, I always joke. People say, you know, flat earth society. I say, you know, uh -huh. uh, the earth is a sphere, no matter what the flat earth society says, you know, people start to laugh and I say, you know, they're not stupid. They're not stupid. You know, they're just wrong. The evidence is in an overwhelming fashion where Earth is a sphere. And um, um, they find ways to, uh, uh, um, to question your own sanity. You know, these are the questions that the normal person just doesn't have an answer as far as they say. And if you look outside, you know, the horizon is flat. You know, that means the Earth is flat, right? But if you do huh. math, you say, well, if the circumference of the Earth is 40,000 kilometer, what you see here is such a small angular uh, angular arc that it appears to be flat. But nevertheless, hmm. I have I am in no position to say somebody is, you know, dumb or stupid. I, I just, you know, we all are uh, we all are of the same species and um, uh, uh, and uh, sometimes it's just, you know, I don't call them conspiracy theorists. It's, a, it's an opinion because a theory, according to the scientific process, is not an opinion. So it has been proven. Oh, falsified. yeah. Real theories amongst real scientists are, uh, it's like a meat grinder. I mean, there's, oh, there's my God. Yeah. you know, major scientists who devote their lives to crushing your theory, you know, if, if you if you can get to the theory stage, so it just starts out as maybe an idea, then you develop a hypothesis, and then, you know, then you got to have some, 
experimental things to kind of support something that might become a theory. And then from then on out, I mean, Einstein's theories are still being, you know, scientists are trying to rip them apart, you know, uh, if they can, you know, to prove Einstein wrong somehow. But uh, so far, uh, you know, Einstein's still bat batting a thousand. So, you know, so far. In our cosmology class right now, we're doing the special and general theory of relativity. And it has been proven over and over and over again. I'm working on a on a course for the for the fall for our astronomy club about the special and general theory What's of relativity because it's uh, it's really fascinating what einstein came up with and his gedanken experiment his thought experiments what would it look like if i am riding on a bicycle next to a beam of light you know this is just mind boggling this was yeah. 100 20 years ago of course he was working as a patent clerk he had plenty of time to think to think things <laughs> about <laughs> these things yeah i don't want i don't want to say patent clerks have a lot of time on their hand and what they do is not important it is <laughs> but he was just an incredible an incredible genius the the thoughts that he had and his his thought experiments with the with running trains and lightning striking in the middle of the train and a mirror and detectors and clocks and somebody an observer standing on a on a uh, uh, on a platform at rest and the yeah. thing the theories that he came up with it is mind boggling still today I sit there and scratch my head I'm thinking how can you know right right. Well, wow. well, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Uh, you're you are living uh, what a lot of people would uh, kind of tongue in cheek say you're living the dream, and uh, you know I I know that um, I know that the passion that you have, um, you know the interest level that you have and the care that you take uh, really will change people's lives. Um, Sometimes, I mean, I've heard scientists say this, you know, they go, look, the, the explaining the technical things or, you know, the science is easy, okay? Mm -hmm. But inspiring someone, okay, that's, that's something totally different, you know? And so there are, there are gifted educators that do both, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that, that that's, uh, I think you're doing that, so. Thank you. I, uh, I actually, to give you an example, how we inspire each other. Mm. Um, I was uh, part of my job. I was visiting uh, elementary schools last year in, in the fall uh, to hand out uh, um, fourth grade passes, get kids in the uh, national parks. And I was, I had two major projects. I was doing variable star observation and some computational astrophysical problem with our supercomputer. And, um, after I visited one of these classes, this fourth grader, this little girl, she wrote, while I had my presentation, she wrote a letter to me. I'm just going to, I'm just going to read you the first few lines. Okay. She's telling you that I get inspired too by kids. Hopefully yeah. I'll be able to share some of my passion. So she was writing astronomy, astronomy. Did you know that there are millions of different universes and galaxies in space? There are other spaces and there are other solar system, not just ours. Did you know that almost every planet in our universe is named after a goddess? Hmm. I'm a master of science. I can make about anything. And there is thousands of zodiac signs. I also have rocks that came from space. Some look like they were melting. I like to learn something new every day. I can make volcanoes. And the more black holes swallows stuff, the more bigger it gets. I'm going to start making science projects and taking pictures. I love learning about amazing things. Wow. That's great. How old is she? Nine years old? Something Nine like years old. I had wow. this as my motivation to get through my semester. So yeah, 
we inspire awesome. each other. That's you know, this is a circle, right? Yeah, it's like the Ouroboros. Um, so as long as we end up in the same place with a new perspective, I think going in circles is fine. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming on, Matthias, and sharing this with us. And uh, we'll have you on again um, and, uh, and learn more about uh, Stargazing Zion. I think it's going to mushroom here pretty soon. So thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, Guys. good night. Thank you. OK. So Maxi, uh, it is your time. And um, thank you for coming on. Uh, and uh, you said you had some new astrophotography that you wanted to share. Yes, I, I was. Well, hi, everybody. Good night. Uh, I was doing some pictures this weekend. Uh, yeah. I have maybe almost all night long. And well, uh, there was pretty amazing night because there was no wind. The moon was coming up more later. And also I could see uh, the conjunction of Venus, Saturn, Mars, and the Moon, and well, uh, I try to to stack and process my images. I I want to share my screen. Let me uh, here. Okay, do you see it? Yes, that awesome eclipse shot. <laughs> Thank you. That this is one twenty twenty in the fourth. 14th of December. Mm -hmm. So basically, I went to three places. Uh, they're almost been in Carina region and Centaurus region uh, here in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I started with taking pictures of the Gabriela Mistral Nebula. Uh, this is a, a single frame that I could take you can see here's the nebula uh, practically and here's this uh, a cluster of stars nearby and i was all, almost one hour taking pictures and well i tried to to process stack and i think i just finished these pictures uh, this is the result Practically, I turn the. Let me. I can see because of this menu here to put more larger. Uh, here's the the face of, uh, like we say more early, of Gabriela Mistral or the Senator Palpatine from Star Wars, <laughs> uh, looking uh, this eyes. So also in this place, this is really awesome. The topic of today was the reflections. And I want to talk about the lights of the reflections that are produced by stars. In this case, they are reflecting all this nebulosity. And because of them, we, can, we are able to uh, see uh, in our eyes, or in this case with the cameras, all these colors and and shapes because if this wasn't there uh, they're all all be black practically so this is just finished pictures that i did uh, and another place that i went it was uh, to the ngc uh, 3621 this is a, a galaxy. Uh, also, I think it's in Centaurus uh, place. I couldn't finally process this, but let me see if I if we can see it here. This is only a stack of all the pictures, and I have to keep uh, processing the colors mm -hmm. and the shape and get it more a uh, focus. But uh, focus a, looks nice to me. Yeah, but it, it, to get a more deconvolution in the structure of the galaxy, you can see the in the arms. 
oh, and yeah. the clouds is like a blur. So hmm. with the con with the, the convolution tool, you can get it more uh, like a focus, more details. I see. But you have to be careful because you don't want to mess up the entire image. So it's a, a delicate process. But here, anyway, uh, there's a lot of galaxies. Uh, for example, there's one up here. This, they are really, really far away. Uh, also, well, here's another one. And, and it, I had to crop this image because one size of this uh, uh, stack uh, it was messed up. But in that part, uh, there was like a, a galaxy cluster. It was really, really good area. But uh, this was taken here in my backyard uh, in Bortle six, seven skies. And anyway, I for now, I, I'm still able to 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 get in pictures. So the next uh, object was um, uh, was the almost taking pictures uh, of the entire night, almost, I think it was four hours, maybe. It was 60 image at 30, at three minutes. And, uh, yeah, uh, three hours, practically. Oh, wow. Uh, taking pictures of this area, uh, also near in Centaurus uh, constellation. And this was a, one object that Rodrigo Celada showed was the last GSP uh, in in the star party that they went uh, in Chile, and I I didn't know this object, so I tried to to get it from here. And for example, this is a, a single shot of three minutes, and you can see it's some kind oh, of yeah. reflection. Yes, this tiny galaxy. But yeah. the, there's the edge only on, stars. Edge on galaxy there. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I could do in the, the stack <clears throat> and process was uh, this. No, sorry. This is, was not. It was. Yeah, I think this is one. Well, I have in even that portal and these three hours, I could wow. give a, almost well, it the shape. Really three, it looks more three dimensional, you know, it's. Um... Mm -hmm. For the background, I tried to be, uh, has to be, be careful to not uh, screw it, but uh, you can see also here, we have the, the reflection of this. This is our two stars. You can see like a, an eight. They are really nearby one of each other. But for example, here's another one he, who's uh, reflecting this place at the background of this uh, entire uh, nebulosity. And here's the that little galaxy I I couldn't couldn't get more too much details here, but uh, anyway, I uh, the next weekend uh, maybe we can go to Alberti, and uh, I I I think I will going to take pictures of, from this place again uh, for the entire night practically trying to get six hours less to and of course with good. A darkness sky so maybe i can get more information and details on all the nebulosity and the structures so <clears throat> that's that's how I, I can get it uh so basically that's that's what i what i did uh, this weekend i beautiful i i have almost two weeks with well, moonlight and uh, clouds, wind, 
cold uh, weather, hot right. weather. So now, well, <laughs> I, I had to to take advantage that that night. Uh, tonight was night. Uh, it's uh, clear again, but it's a lot of wind outside and it's really cold. So uh, I I want to uh, save my energy for the weekend. <laughs> for the weekend. <laughs> for the. So, yes. well. Uh, that's that's my little presentation for yeah. tonight. I hope that you like it's it. Nice, it's good. Maxi, I I know that you too are involved. I think that you were involved with uh, trying to get a uh, an observatory um, working again for the for public outreach. How is that going? Yes, uh, it's uh, getting uh, in this month. I talk with uh, what, what you mean the the observatory of Alberti. I think so, because uh, uh, you were showing the, us the, the place where I where we're going to to meet. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, I talked with Marcos. Uh, I think yesterday because I I want to to tell him that we want to be there this weekend. He could not be able, but uh, he uh, told me that the 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 construction and the the restoration uh, the, of the first phase is uh, uh, going again uh, working and he thinks maybe the uh, the next uh, month or maybe in in the finally of may it will be that part finished so they can start to <clears throat> uh, build the new observatory right now the first phase is a uh, practically um, a restoration the restoration of the entire mm -hmm. uh, school yes. and to uh, so people can go and have um, this uh, I, I don't know how to say be comfortable there not mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have bathroom you have what a, a cold and hot water um, you, you can get a shower, you can rest, oh, nice. uh, you, you can prepare some food maybe, and also uh, they're trying to get an uh, internet connection because mm -hmm. the, the, um, a, a wire is passing by in the street, uh, but uh, they, they want to finish that part to start to do also uh, meetings with, the, um, with, with their uh, students and, and other schools from the area uh, and also uh, do meetings of uh, astronauts uh, mm -hmm. to get uh, stargazing and also for people like us the astro amateur astronomers amateur astrophotographers uh, that wants to be with some kind of good skies and be comfortable uh, yes also you can go with with your um uh, uh, I, I don't know how to say it. Where, where are you going to sleep uh, in, in, in a camp? Um, yeah. Uh, and I don't. The, tent. The, in a tent. tent. In a yes. tent. Yes. Uh, you can, you can uh, bring that uh, and you can rest in there if you want. Uh, but the, 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 the another way is to be more comfortable and with a good weather uh, with a with, uh, with a good um a temperature inside there if yes. you want to rest it's not too yeah. cold you get you're warm you're mm -hmm. yeah you can eat something you uh, like you said take a shower these things these are all exactly. the things that you know professional astronomers get to do when they go to the big observatories because <laughs> most yeah. of them have like a place for the astronomers to stay mm -hmm. uh it is important uh i think for amateur astronomers to try to get as comfortable as they can um because also if uh, you are doing a, or you're driving a lot or maybe you're you, driving you, a lot you're up late at night uh you know uh, you might be a little dehydrated you know uh these kinds of things uh, if you go to where it's high and dry and um you know so and a lot of amateur astronomers kind of push the limits you know um uh, because they wow the sky's great and everything and then and you forget you know, to it's a little dangerous water. to drive back home you know you're tired you're sleepy uh, these kinds of things so and i've experienced that myself so it's uh um 
definitely these days, you know, when I go to a, a stargazing event, I have a trailer, I bring it, you know, it's, it's the best accessory I can think of for an amateur astronomer, because when I'm ready to uh, go to sleep, I walk five steps, go to my trailer and I fall asleep, you know, so, and it's got a little kitchen and bathroom and a little shower. So it's, it's perfect for someone like me. Mm -hmm. um, if I had a, a permanent facility, that would be even better, you know, so yeah. uh, I'm glad that you guys are building that out. Well, maybe you can hear maybe some uh, noises of the, some animals, some pigeons or something like that in the middle <laughs> of the night. Don't be scared, but... <laughs> Don't be scared. <laughs> maybe you can wake up with a pigeon behind your, your face yeah. or something. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. <laughs> We nah, used to observe nah. a lot in the deserts of California, and there's a lot of coyotes, mm. uh, snakes, um, you know, stuff like that yes. out there. Oh, or lizards. We have uh, the uh, lagarto overo, overo lizard. It's so like how big is it? It's it's big. It's it's more um, afraid of us that we are afraid from him. But sure. He he appears at the at, at the day because he needs oh. uh, heat. But at night we maybe we have um, uh, Sorino. They they are pretty smell. Uh, yeah, like yeah, we, yeah, yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah, skunks. Uh, skunks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Pep, Pep Le Pew, for example. <laughs> but not yeah. that romantic and well uh well we have uh, birds uh, we have bats we have the entire animal that they are in in rural places uh, squirrels we don't have here uh, no no we no squirrels no but in Luhan they a, a, maybe 20 years ago uh, some people uh, put uh, uh, bring to Argentina squirrels, and they start to be everywhere. They multiply. Oh yeah, they like multiply. crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. The, the same thing in, for example, the, today Matias say was in Ushuaia, they have a uh, huge problems with um, uh, how how you say the 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 animal that um, uh, eats uh, wood and the. Um, uh, no, no, the, it's like uh, el castor, um, the beaver. Oh, uh, the the beaver is is beaver. Isn't beaver. It's oh. not from this place. I uh, see. So they. Yeah. This is a problem all over the world, you know, because as people traveled on ships to the, where they would bring animals, thinking, okay, we need this, or we'll we'll bring some of these over here. You you uh, have. Uh, uh, up there in uh, you have wolves you have uh, coyotes you have yeah. bears yes. we don't have those animals here so oh. they don't have pred predators only pumas that's all yeah just a puma <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah uh, that's why they can multiply and it's a huge uh, risk from the um, the the the, the colleges of here for example yes right so well uh, like, like we say um the the, the observatory is uh, uh starting again with the with the, the reconstruction uh he he told me that when we went when, when we go this week weekend uh, we can see some kind of changes uh maybe a couple of months they we can do some barbecues because they will put some parishas so if you go at the day or afternoon we yeah. prepare and then of course at the night they will go off because of the smoke but uh, we can we can do that and like i said it's a uh, thinking of trying to be comfortable and and of course, uh, and the accent of, of, of this is for everyone. It's free. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's great. Uh, that's well, well uh, the education here in Argentina is mostly free. 
and also the the, the, the healthcare is free. If you wow, have some wonderful. problem, you can go to the hospital. They will not. Uh, you, you don't have to pay. Of yeah. course, the, this is has some uh, maybe uh, differences between a private uh, hospital or private. Uh, sure. Yeah, uh, there's school. always specialists in private hospitals and stuff that for people who want to pay for it, you know, or or can exactly. pay for it, but. Uh, it's it's very nice that your country uh, supports um, you know all citizens with free health care. You know mm -hmm. that's great. That's great. Yes, exactly. Yep. So there's there's uh, uh, you know there's lots of thoughts and, and very political divides over in the United States over these kinds of things. But uh, you know I have been in countries where. Um, uh, healthcare is uh, essentially free, and uh, it's just like one less worry, especially for uh, older people. So you know, um, and I would think that um, you know, in in your in your senior years, you know, if you're devoting yourself uh, to um, you know lifestyle like astronomy, you know, uh, again, that's just another thing that you don't have to worry that your money's going to be going to is a lot of healthcare bills. You know, so yeah, yeah. So. Uh, in this case, the 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 government supports you, and that's why in the taxes and in the in, well, it's supposed to be to go there. Sometimes not. Sometimes I, yeah, I yeah, don't. Yeah. I, I'm not uh, someone to to judge, but you see those things in the in the facts. So. Uh, well, that's uh, that's how we are here from now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Well, well I, thank I love you, Maxi. That, I love that vixen that's behind you. That's a pretty good <laughs> you want telescope. To try this telescope. Yeah. For planetary, yeah. that that will be very very good. I think so. Yeah, I'm anxious to start looking through it. So we get um, uh, Arkansas. We get uh, two or three days of nice weather and then you know thunderstorms or high winds or something so <laughs> you can um, but i i will get my chance here pretty soon so. well you you if you wake up early you can try with venus maybe yes. saturn i don't know jupiter is really low now but near from the sun but uh, also with the moon maybe mm -hmm. with that scope i think it's going to be it's a uh, two inches of uh, uh, outside uh, when you put the, the ocular or yeah it's a two eyepiece. inch focuser yeah, oh, yeah. So and it has that's... a um, has a flat field adapter right in front of the secondary so uh-huh uh -huh. oh that's nice yes and um uh you know it's uh it's a six inches or eight, eight. inches it's an eight inch f9 <laughs> yes yeah. It's really good for galaxies. Yeah. <laughs> or planetary yeah. nebula, yeah. Also. So that's that's good if the if the it has that corrector uh, it, it gets more flatter the, the image. Uh, I have yet to actually examine, critically examine uh, astrophotographs from it, but I will be soon. So oh. yeah. Okay. I'll I, let you know I, how it goes. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, but I'm very, I, it's on my desk. So I'm very interested in this particular design myself. So mm -hmm. that's fine. That's nice. That's that's a, a huge a focal lens. Yeah. So, well, uh, I, okay. So, Maxi, what's on what's on your horizon? What's your what well, are you just going to image more of this uh, object you showed tonight? Uh, just get some more time in on it and then uh, and then what, do you have another object that you're planning or how, what's your process like? What do you, how do you decide what you're going to be imaging? Well, basically I, I, I use Stellarium and Sky Safari to, to see what uh, depends of the, the magnitude that says mm -hmm. this uh, softwares. And then I, I put uh, the configuration of my scope and my size of the, of the sensor to get how is my field of view. 
So maybe if I see a galaxy or when you see that's a beautiful picture of Hubble. And, but when I go with my scope, I see a really tiny or maybe they are really big or maybe I have a medium size. So I, I want, I, I want to, to, to be prepared for uh, what I'm going to take. And also uh, what is, uh, if it's passing by uh, through my Senate or maybe it's low to the south or maybe it's more to the northwest or the east. And uh, for example, uh, the system galaxies that I have, I have the Marcanian chain, uh, but they, they are maybe almost 40 degrees passing by. I have almost four hours, but for mm -hmm. taking good pictures, maybe there are two. So I had to be too many nights taking pictures of there so to get more info. I so I, I, I always want to take pictures that, that objects that, that, that I have much, uh, too much time, but uh, sometimes the, the, the feelings of, oh, I want to take this picture because I, 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 I put the, the scope to, to capture, but I, I start to see what, what ob uh, what's another object that passing by. And I say, oh, maybe this object I can see. So I want to take pictures of, to everything. <laughs> and yes. that's, that's a big mistake because you don't concentrate in one object to, to get more info so you can process them uh, with uh, much details. Right. So, well, I, I hope uh, this week uh, to co continue taking pictures to this nebulosity. Uh, like I said, maybe six hours uh, less uh, with board to three skies. So I think the, the info was going to be more, more better than here in my city. And well, I, I love to take pictures of galaxies uh, also, but uh, I think maybe with my scope, I at the edge of what I want to get, you know, and uh, for example, some galaxies, you can get some really pretty good shapes, but in other ones, they are a little blurry or you want to get more detail. That's the, the, I don't know how to say, a, a, el vicio or vicious that wants to, uh, to get the next step. And so, well, this is my goal for now. Yeah, yeah well, you're a great astrophotographer. And, um, you know, I think that you'll reach all your goals. So probably exceed them. Uh, you know, when, once you get astrophotographers, they're the kind of people that you know, once they hit a level, then they want to go, they want to break through that, you know, so, right? Yep. Well, thank you very much, Maxi. Thanks for coming yeah. on to Global Star Party again. And uh, I see Dan and, and Matthias are still back there. So thanks very much, guys. And I want to thank the audience for um, being with us tonight. Uh, the conversations turned towards uh, uh, went from squirrels to uh, them talking about microscopes. So <laughs> I guess I'll have to break out some microscope, uh, 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 you know, some of my microbes and uh, tardy grades and stuff like that. So and um, it was a lot of fun today. We had uh, really interesting talks by everyone. Uh, um, you know, earlier our first, in, in our first section, we had, uh, uh, of course, David Levy and uh, Don Nab from the Astronomical League, Dave Iker from Astronomy Magazine, uh, John Briggs, uh, the newly appointed secretary of the uh, Alliance of Historic Observatories, was with us talking about Lowell Observatory in particular, and then they brought on Kevin Schindler from Lowell, um, who's uh, their public uh, outreach officer over there. Uh, Kareem, Professor Kareem Jaffer uh, from John Abbott College and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada was on with us. Uh, 
very interesting. Uh, young Navin and his uh, and his uh, special guest gave a uh, you know, powerhouse uh, uh, talk about um, reflections. Really cool. Of course, Adrian Bradley sharing his nightscape astrophotography with us. And then we have Marcello Souza with uh, his students um, from the uh, uh, Young Stars of Tomorrow and um, you know his uh, projects that they conduct in Brazil. Uh, it was very interesting to, to know that they had created an app for reporting uh, uh, details about uh, variable stars so they could create light curves. Um, and then uh, Dan Higgins was on with uh, Astroworld TV. He's, uh, as I mentioned, he's still, he's still back there in the Zoom room with us. Um, Matthias Schmidt, who's also still with us, uh, talking about stargazing Zion and uh, the transformative experience of astronomy. Um, and then ending our program tonight right here with Maxi so, and his awesome astrophotography. So thank you very much. Um, we'll be back uh, next Tuesday. Uh, for the 89th Global Star Party, and uh, I look forward to it. So maybe uh, Cesar Brello will be back with us by that time. So, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and, you, guys. Uh, good night, everyone. You guys have a great night and uh, good rest until next Tuesday where we'll keep you up late again. So.